Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Jeremy Richardson. Jeremy is an expert in healthcare IT who is currently building expertise in education. Jeremy, welcome to the pod. Mm, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, really fun to meet with you a couple weeks ago. And yeah, I mean, what a cool, I don't know, cool setup, cool invitation. So Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, for people listening, we met on like a CMU alumni group on Slack and uh, just grabbed a coffee and uh, hit it off pretty quick. And so I thought it'd be fun to do this and I appreciate you accepting the invite. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I guess, um, do you want to talk at all about like your, your current projects or? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't make sense without like a little bit of backstory. Yeah, but, sure. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of backstory, um, you know, I spent a lot of time in healthcare, healthcare, right? Um, you know, just building things. Um, started out as a software engineer, and it was kind of accidental that I got there. Um, I spent time, like, like my, I, I took a, or spent a lot of money on a graduate program um, called uh, the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon, and thought I was going to get into educational technology. But I ended up in healthcare, um, and it was pr totally because of the dot com bust. Um, you know, I had a job getting out of school, and it just kind of went away. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those things where yeah, you're out of out of work for eight, eight months, right? And you sort of look back on that, and you can see yeah, that actually has a real impact in terms of how you look at money. Um, and I think that's actually Absolutely. one of those big issues that we have. Um, you know, in technology, in, you know, what I might call sort of a privileged world, um, it's still like not necessarily this, yeah, we still still are, are always sort of like trying to figure out how do we um, make enough that, you know, like if things go bad, right, we're going to be okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's not always appreciation for like having, you know, no, knowing and appreciating what you have. Um, and I think, you know, I was in healthcare for, you know, probably 14 or actually for almost 20 years, started a company, sold it, um, you know, it's kind of an aqua hire sort of deal, but it like wound up. This would have been M modal. So we, we sold to M modal. Um, and it was kind of this confluence of, you know, just, we were, we were in the right place at the right time with the right people and, and going in the right direction. Um, that, you know, we were part of this, you know, buyout and, or, or like this coming together of a bunch of different companies. Cool. Um, and, and it worked out well for us. Um, and then we, we spent 10 years, I spent 10 years at Immodal, um, and eventually got bought by 3M, you know, the post-it note company. <laughs> and like, you know, yeah, post-it notes, right? They're not always, like, like, it's a very different thing than software development. Um, it literally like to to come out with a different type of post-it, right, or a different color of post-it. Um, you know, might take months or years. Um, <laughs> you know, my my sense is it take it take a year, maybe two, um, to basically get it approved. And you know, it's something where with software, it's you know, you go, you talk to your customers, and you know, you have this idea, there's this enabling technology, hey, let's go ahead and do this thing, let's prototype it. Yeah. And even with healthcare, right? Like you could conceivably get it to the customer pretty quickly. Yeah, um, well that's true in hardware too, from experience. Yeah, yeah, but, and and for from a prototype perspective, yeah, certainly. Um, but like- Oh, but you mean you can have production code running on a customer's machine? Okay, wow, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you have to go through, you know, due diligence, right? You you figure out how to regression test and how to do the, the appropriate testing, but, um, you know, then you can you can actually roll it out pretty quickly and, and have a way to roll it back. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's something where, um, yeah, 3M, well, yeah, they had different ideas in terms of what they wanted from us. Um, it's very much, you know, I think, you know, it's hardware, hardware, right? It's a low, gr or not hardware, but like material goods that they make, right? It's, it's a low margin, low innovation business. Um, you know, command strips are a fantastic innovation. I love them, but it's also, you know, there aren't that many new things that really sort of lead to lead to change. Um, uh, command strips? Just a 
Yeah, command strips are like how you like hang stuff on the wall without nails. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, they make those, um, you know, along with, you know, like, yeah, masks and I don't know, they make everything physical. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, for me, you know, it's leaving, um, you know, the, the decision to leave the company, right? Like, it's actually really, like, it was, it was interesting. The psychology of it was interesting. Um, even for someone like me who's, you know, was in a position to leave, you know, I'm not in a position where I can retire, but I'm in a position where, you know, I can, like, there's a lot of flexibility um, in terms of the choices I can make. And so cool. some of it was like, you know, it's sort of, you know, I'm really interested in that psychology of like, what was the resistance to leave? Because after I left, um, you know, I found so many good, wonderful things to do. Um, and one of the, the best things I've done is really, the, the things I've enjoyed, thing I've enjoyed most is teaching computer science. Oh, cool. Um, three days a week, like for underprivileged school in Jacksonville, Florida, through a, a Microsoft program. And, and it's like, yeah, and, and so right now, like in terms of projects, like that's where, where a lot of my passion and energy come from. And it's pointing me in that direction, right? Going to educational technology. Um, and I think for me, you know, so right now I, I meant like what I was, my work today was finishing up a set of posts that are basically reflections on really the last um, two months of teaching, yeah. which is really like real, you know, it was, it, this is the point where I've really realized, oh sh shit, like yeah. we totally missed the mark in terms of really preparing these kids. Um, and it's something where looking at that, it's like, okay, you know, what can we do better next year? What are the things that we missed? What are the, you know, what are the questions I can ask and, and how can I engage, you know, the great teachers out there? Because there's some teachers out there who are just absolutely exceptional. Um, I talked with one yesterday who's, you know, been teaching for 15 years. Oh, cool. Um, built a computer science department at a, at a private school in the city. Um, and you know, he's just in New York, you know, say the, the in Pittsburgh, actually. Okay, cool. So, and, and he, you know, it's something where, you know, thinking about that, right. There are some wonderful lessons for all the teachers who, you know, there are apparently a lot of gym teachers, shop teachers, right. Who've been put into service as computer science teachers oh, with interesting. with this idea that, you know, computer science is kind of like shop, right? It's a it's total horseshit, of course. Well, <laughs> right. Like it's it's like, right. It's this idea that it is um, technical education, and yeah, it's technical. It's technical as hell, right? But it's like it's it, it actually when when I look at it, I can stitch through and make connections with every every important subject, right? Every subject that's related to thinking. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and, and I think, you know, that's where, so I'm, I've been writing about that and thinking about what are the ways that I can actually sort of make a dent in the universe to, you know, what I've, what I've decided I'm doing is I've decided that sustainability is the existential challenge of our time, equity is the moral challenge of our time, and I can set the table with education. Used to be education and healthcare, but I think I'm, I'm pushing healthcare off so for now. I guess that's that's awesome. First of all, but second of all, I just want to understand and make sure I'm understanding. Yep. So sustainability um, and then equity, I feel like can be used as buzzwords. Like, what yep. do you mean in this context when you say those things? I guess? Yeah. So sustainability is this idea that um, you know I've, I've got three kids yeah. and I want them to have a great life. Cool. Um, and in the past, you know, past probably five to seven years, I've been really changing my understanding of what that means. Um, thinking about, and when I think about education, I think, you know, one of the things we need to do when we educate students is actually, and this is what I want to do for my kids, actually show them a breadth of choices. Nice. And push them to try some things that they don't necessarily think they're going to like, um, but just get them to try them out. Um, and and try to try to build up their confidence, you know, to figure out like is that something? Is it something that they would ultimately like? Because right? a career is more sustainable if you're satisfied doing the thing. And you're not going to know if you're satisfied doing it until you try it. That is absolutely part of it. Um, but you know, the other side of it is just like oh, you find like finding something that you're passionate about. 
um, you know, like for a long time, you know, I, I, well, I guess one example, you know, I remember the, the Barbie doll, and, and maybe this is an urban myth, right? But I think there was a Barbie <laughs> doll that you would like press a button on its back and it would say, meth is tough. And it's like, well, okay, that's the wrong lesson. Like, that's that's something that we, you know... I've never we, heard about that, but that's hilarious. <laughs> that, that's something that I think we were, you know, we've been pushing on on young girls. And, and a friend of mine, um, you know, was talking about, you know, studies about, you know, black children looking at dolls and having a black doll and a white doll. And, you know, being asked the question, well, which doll is pretty? Well, it's the white doll. Ah, well, brutal. which doll is smart? It's the white doll. That and sucks. so, so it's something where, like, I, I think that, like, that, that, you know, is, is sort of goes to equity, but it's also something where when I think about Martin Luther King and, and really, like, one of the, the key lines from the I Have a Dream speech is, you know, um, judged by the, the, or, not judged by the, the color of your skin, but by the content of your character. Amen to that. And that's, that's universal, right? Yeah. Two white guys, you know, m most, well, there are definitely <laughs> some people who would, would cringe at seeing two white guys talking about that. Sure. But that's also the thing that, like, I, I don't think Martin Luther King would be one of them. I think he would be happy, right? To, like, to happy that maybe there, there are people who, yeah, like, I mean, I mean, I think, I think he would, he would get, a, he'd be fine with it, right? I think he'd be happy about it, right? It's, it's about his message, right? And this message of ultimately, you know, I think universal love yeah. and universal like acceptance and and really giving people a chance for who they are. Yeah. And so, you know, so like when I when I talk about sustainability, it's coming back to it. It's, um, it's really thinking about what is this like? What does the society look like? So societal sustainability, like how so, do we keep society going? But but how you keep society going from the perspective of everyone has like enough, right? That's part, I think that like equity and sustainability, I guess I'm, I'm realizing, right? It's very hard for me to pull them apart because yeah. sustainability. Well, if equity is defined in the, you know, I wasn't sure if you meant stock options or it sounds like yeah. it's racial equity. So like treating everybody the same regardless where they're from. And it's not right. just racial, right? It's it's like it's also geographic. geographic. It's socioeconomic. It's like actually asking, like being able to ask the question. So judging people on the content of their character, and not by the color of their skin, or where they're from, or, or where they're from, right? Yeah. I think that How that much all money their parents have, or any of that crap. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, but like sustainability, right? In terms of like, you know, stopping climate change, like that's something that um, you know. Like when I think about education, right? Yeah. Um, that feels gonna, to me like a different thing. It's going to take engineers. It's going to take business people to solve it. Oh, I see. It's going to take people so it who feeds in even now. But it's also it's also aligning and saying, oh, you know, like we are taking advantage of um, people who are doing mining in Africa for certain minerals that we use in car batteries or using electronics, and like figuring out, well, you know, like are they actually getting a living wage, right? Are they making enough for their area, right? Um, and then also like looking at their area and asking the question, like, you know, what is their actual standard of living, right? Like we know, okay, San Francisco's got, you know, you, if, you, if you wanna buy a house in Pittsburgh, you can buy one for $300,000. Yeah, a decent one at that. Yeah, and in San Francisco, it's, it's 10 Two times million. as much, right? Yeah. I, I, would, I would argue that- Three million, that sounds like is what you're arguing. Well, I was talking to people it's like two million dollar homes, right? Mm -hmm. And and you know, it's something where, like, you know, there's that, and I would say San Francisco is not appreciably better, right? It's not ten x better. I don't think so. In terms of quality of life, um, in fact, I would I would actually argue, like, talking to some of my friends, it's just much worse, right? In terms of what, if you're judging on money, it's fucking fantastic. If you're judging on 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 actual emotion um actually how people feel um you know I, my my discussions are only anecdotal but you know some of my some good friends you know aren't necessarily living the life they want to live and they don't know it i just had a buddy visit me from san francisco and he was like i miss pittsburgh he also went to cmu he's like i miss pittsburgh so much it's so great to be here yeah <laughs> you know? yes yeah. so. but so yeah. 
But so, yeah, I mean, I think sustainability is, you know, there, there are definitely social changes that need to be made to actually be able to have the equity changes. And I think those things support each other and those actually come back into things like, oh, you know, maybe, maybe we do need to figure out how do we, I mean, ultimately, like how we solve our, our relationship with oil, how we solve our relationship with energy, how we solve our relationship it still with still feels pollution. like a different thing than societal sustainability. Like, I feel like energy sustainability is like how we increase utilization of a finite resource, where societal is like, how do we keep the population strong and going? But then I guess where they get intermixed, and I'm just yeah. sort of trying to dissect yeah. it and understand yeah. it, is the fact that you sort of need engineers and, and a strong working population to solve difficult engineering problems. I was actually thinking about this the other day. I Actually, I, I was re-listening listen, to one of these podcasts, and I had a guy on, we were talking about it. And I feel like when you, when you sort of empower people and you give educational yeah. options, like I, I do think that should probably... Not to get political, but I, I'm of the opinion that should probably be universally available. Like as much as you know, we can do as a like I don't know how to do it, so I'm kind of a hypocrite here. But I mean, I don't know. I mean, you unlock more talent that helps industry. I mean, all of us profit, so I, I think it's a good thing. I would say like not knowing how to do it doesn't make you a hypocrite. Um, and I think hypocrite's one of those words that I know, but I hate to like to, complain, to, but like not have a solution because that it, seems yeah, stupid. and and I. Th- think that that's a that's a fantastic um attitude to like to like be able to sort of because it, it sort of opens you up to like looking around for solutions and looking around for problems that you might spencer might be able to solve sure right and actually that's one of those things where yeah like like in terms of your journey right like you know if that if that sort of came up on your rung of oh you know you obviously need money right to to live and you know, well, yeah, to, to live your life, but like, you know, like it's an opportunity for you to say, and, and this is happening all the time in software, right? It's, do I want to take the extra money? Um, you know, because Google pays ridiculous amounts right now. Facebook yeah. pays ridiculous amounts. Sure. Um, or, or do I want to take I've a lower salary? away sal- from Google a few times. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you want to take a lower salary and solve a problem that, um, that is actually that's meaningful to you and you know if you if you take a position like you're saying like oh we should have universal access right um you know that that means a lot when like it means a lot to me as a father of three boys and you know it's something where i do want to figure out how to communicate that to to single people right who don't necessarily have that you know that driver um i mean i don't have kids but i right try to zoom out and just see what's good for everybody and I work with I mean you know people that are coming up in industry like recent college graduates and grad school grads and stuff and you know I want to see them succeed and so you know sort of I'm sure it's nothing like being a parent but you feel a sense of uh, responsibility for the people that report to you and rely on you to give them guidance and mentorship and direction yeah help them make decisions or if somebody comes to you and like they want to work somewhere else and they're asking for a reference. I mean, you have to be non-selfish, you know, yeah. and just be like, yeah. Yeah. And that took a while for me to figure out as a manager, it was like, you know, right. I, the first time that happened, I was like kind of pissed off at the person and resentful and, you know, pretty mad that they wanted to leave my team. And then, you know, now if somebody wants to do that, you know, I'm like, yeah, I support you. you know? Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's powerful. Um, you know, like, like, let me come back back to that quick, or in just a sec. I think the thing with kids is I've got this like multi generational view now, thinking about like how much fun I have with my kids and how I see nice. my grand or my mother having fun with her grandkids. And I think about that, right? It's like, what do we actually need to do to make sure that my grandkids are there for you know I'm there to like take care of my grandkids and and have this perspective that they're they're going to be able to have their own grandkids and so we're talking four generations five generations and thinking about that well like yeah that's that's where environmental sustainability and equity come in because it's like you know yeah as you know it it yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to don't want to delve too much into racial politics, right? But sure. do want to just say, 
like let's look at like looking at the world and realizing like there realizing there are these inequities like what does it take to get to a point where it's um, pretty obvious if you've traveled or spent any time yeah in different places I mean. and and it's it's something where it's like if i was in their position in the position of like i was watching a video about lagos nigeria and and the slums of lagos nigeria um and you know it's one of those things where it's like yeah if i was in that position i like there are a lot of things i might do right like to to change that position they're they're fighting for survival on a daily basis um and it's something where you know for me that that means you know and i put this like to some friends the other day and it just came out of my mouth just kind of blurted out right like like that means this problem is urgent and it has to be urgent to us right like we might be in a position and, and it's like thinking about it it's we might be in a position of privilege but it's like that can disappear um sure. And, and the best way to make sure that doesn't dis doesn't disappear is to make sure that the rising tide raises all ships. And I'm not sure that there's, you know, there, there's a lot of scarcity in the world, but certainly when it comes to food, um, you know, there's like, there's enough food to go around if we can get it where it needs to Yeah, it almost to be seems gotten. like a transportation issue, I'd kind of agree. Or, or an education issue or a technology issue. Like it's probably probably a little bit of everything also. Do you think it's an incentive issue? Cause like the people with the food, like why should we send it over there? Unless it's gonna increase like the public perception of our goodwill in some way. Well, so I don't know enough about that. Um, the only thing I've heard recently is like a discussion about like allowing sales of Russian grain to Africa. Interesting. And and that was brought up as like it's this it's going to give money to Vladimir Putin, who is, you know, a, a dictator who's trying to, you know, are we willing to sell it to them cheaper? Well, well, right. It's and then there's the humanitarian side, which is very much, um, you know, it, it it's one of those things where it's like I, I kind of kind of of the opinion that if there's no other way to get people food, right, you got to you got to let it happen. Actually, when I was in undergrad, I remember one of my friends. Uh, have you heard of freeganism? No. So it's when you only eat food that's free. <laughs> that's oh, I, I have heard of this. It's, I, so he it's was like really dumpster funny. diving for bread and stuff like the Yeah. The Five Points Bakery, uh, here, which is a great bakery. If it's just such watching. a good bakery. It's so good. And um, he uh, he had this whole bag of like dinner rolls he got from their dumpster that we just referred to as dumpster bread. And they're really good. Like yeah. you could heat them up in the oven and pick them up. And um, they were perfectly fine. I think they were like in an isolated bag. Yeah. And so, I mean, I feel like good food gets thrown out. Like, I didn't, and then I don't know uh, if you're familiar with 412 Food Rescue. I'm absolutely familiar with 412 Food Rescue. Um, it's it's one of the, like I've driven for them. Nice. I give money to them. Um, I'm going to do, they've, they've got a beer run in a week or two. Awesome. Where it's like, you know, you can, you can pay them 10 bucks or like 20 bucks or like 30 bucks. You might get a t-shirt for 30 bucks or pay them a hundred <laughs> bucks. And, and, you know, and, and it's one of those things where, yeah, I mean, I, I'm in a position where I can give them the hundred dollars and something where it's like, I, I want to do that because, you know, like, like it's, it's such an important, like what they're doing, like, I, I'm not actually sure. I haven't read the impact report, but like what they're doing is so important from the perspective of like the, the higher their, their visibility. Yeah the more like my kids will think about that as a career path the more like people will think about how do we so, actually build fantastic organizations that like four and two food rescue like for people who who don't understand right this is a it's it's an organization in pittsburgh that and, and actually they're broadening um they basically go and they work with local businesses um, who, who have food waste um, and make sure that that food waste is distributed to the community. They got volunteers to actually do the distribution um, and and they, they just, yeah, they do a fantastic job from like being able to get money or being able to get food to soup kitchens 
um, being able to get different types of food with different nutritional value. Nice. Um, and then at the same time, right, they've actually started expanding deliveries like during COVID to, um, to individuals who just have a hard time getting around. That's awesome. um, and those are some of the deliveries I did. Just fantastic, fantastic organization. And actually, one of the really cool things, and I love, I love picking apart business models. Like so, it's so fun. I really, I'm not an engineer. I'm, I'm so, such a business person. I'm like a business <laughs> person poet. And then maybe at that point, uh, actually, I'm not a poet. I'm a writer. But, but you like, started as an engineer. <laughs> I know, right? So. Like, yeah. like, yeah. But so. Um, but I can I can draw the linkages between them, right? Um, yeah, for sure. You know, and, and have a problem not doing it, and confuse the hell out of people um, <laughs> often. But so yeah, I think At yeah. The end of the day, we're all people. <laughs> um, but so four and two food rescue has this thing called um, food rescue hero, which is an app that basically they can take to different cities. Yeah. Um, and I had like it's maybe, been around for a while too. Like they've had that for years, as far as I know. Maybe um, I had like two minutes to talk to Leia, who's their like the executive director, and basically she said that she, you know, my first first question, like maybe second question out of my mouth, realizing I didn't have much time, was <laughs> like basically um, how 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 long until you are self sustainable. And for me, you know, that's that's like the the absolute most important question, especially when thinking about a nonprofit. Yeah. Um, well, are you even allowed to retain earnings as a nonprofit? Like, don't you have to disperse it somehow? I've heard. Well, I guess you can have an endowment as a university. Sorry, I should probably. No, 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 no. I, I like. I think that's a that's a great question, and I think the answer is yes. And I thought the answer was no. Um, but I actually do need to go back and look it up. Because you'd think that would be considered profit. <laughs> would, well, it, but yeah. Then I guess yeah. UPMC is like billions and they're considered a nonprofit. So. Right. They, yeah. but, um, but they might, I mean, they might spend it on, well. So if it's in working capital, then maybe it's not considered yeah, I'm not. I'm not either. sure. I'm not sure. Interesting. Um, it probably, it's probably, it's probably also related to you know, you can't distribute to shareholders, right? Because there wouldn't be shareholders. Okay, that sort of um, makes sense. But, um, you know, the, her answer in terms of the sustainability was 40 cities. It's like, wow, like just having that as an answer, right? That's super powerful in terms of just like thinking you can go from, you know, this this really sort of almost essential service that no one thought about, right? Something that would be fabulous if government could do it, but like it's also really good that government's not doing it, right? Because <laughs> because there's so many other competing things and and like they tend to be pretty inefficient. Yeah, and and like ha like finding a passionate person, right, or a set of passionate, like I'm sure Four One Two Food Rescue has a core of just like super passionate people. Yeah. Um, and and from that perspective, right, those are the people you want leading it, right? Because they care. And so, so, you know, 40 cities to get to sustainability, and I don't know what that means, but my sense yeah, is it- curious too. My sense is it means they'll have an ecosystem built in a set of cities that will actually allow the funding of the app, furthering the app, as well as you know, being able to sort of have this sustainable. How would you finance that? I wonder, like without external financing or donations. I think that's a that's a fantastic question. I mean, they're a nonprofit, so there are yeah. probably a lot of lot of nonprofits. Just way to come on. <laughs> if you could get her, um, yeah, fair enough. Busy person, but uh, yeah. but yeah, I mean, like definitely very set. Like we such, have friends in common. Now okay. that <laughs> I'm thinking about it. I mean, such a fantastic, such a cool organization. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I think, but, but like that is a business model, right? Like that's, that's the sort of thing that gets me thinking about what, you know, yeah, like, like what education should be. Because, um, you know, and actually a friend of mine, you know, just said the other day, I don't think he could, like, he, I, he is telling I know me... that you he, could make that self-sustaining, yeah. Well, well, he said he didn't think I could build a VC-backed company. <laughs> and it's one of those things where it's like, I, I actually think he's Wait, right. in general or around education? He didn't think that I would work well in a VC <laughs> environment. 
and and it was like his added his he basically said you know you're not cynical enough um wait it it seems like vcs seek out optimists that's well that well so they might but they also and and so like i think he's also like I, I and I do think VCs are becoming broader in terms of what they're willing to invest in. Maybe not in the past month or two, um, <laughs> right? Like that's <laughs> as the market uh, shits its pants. Yeah, it's right. probably like three months by the time people listen to this. Huh? But there are a lot of um, there are definitely impact investors, um, and I think the, the thing about impact investment that that I think about though is um, isn't like Reed Jobs meant to be in that niche? Or? What do you mean? Steve Jobs' son, I think. Who I don't know. All right, fair enough. Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, no, no. Out. Like, like I think that's a good question. Yeah. Um, and and I think, you know, those are the sorts of things, right, that are are gonna change the world, right? Like, I mean, it's it's thinking about. Yeah, I mean, Bill Gates has like a Netflix thing about him from a couple of years ago, which. Um, I don't know if it's like to whitewash his image, <laughs> but like, you know, and this is before like the, oh yeah, Bill Gates pictures with Jeffrey Epstein were really sort of out and before the divorce. I haven't been following this stuff, so this is interesting. It's this is how I get all my news. Kind of like perfect, right? Yeah. Um, you know, but it's, it's something where, you know, I think like, yeah, like I, I do think that, that the Gates Foundation, right? Like when I think about sustainability, there are a lot of things that they're doing. Yeah. That's that's related to sustainability and equity in the way I would I would think about it. And so, you know, there they would be an obvious, you know, choice for like funding education. But there are a lot of people trying to get that money. Um, and, and one of the things I'm toying with right now is like, OK, I'm really like my brain is just constantly making connections. And I think that's true for everyone. But you know, in terms of like interactions with people, right? Like yeah. my, my brain, I, I think it makes m many more connections than average. Um, and, and it's something where, you know, I think I'm pretty good when it comes to, you know, solutions architecture and product management, product strategy, and, and thinking about like all the different pieces, seeing like a new piece and figuring out where that might fit in. Um, you know, there's obviously like the challenge of actually fitting it in, right? What is the work to actually do the integration? Yeah, um, and that's where my mind tends to go. That is that is <laughs> hard, right? And that is like that is you know nose to the grindstone sort of work. Um, I've found it to be really really valuable when I've done it, um, but also find that like sometimes I need like well. I think I gravitate towards the bigger picture. Yeah. Um, and and because I think yeah, it's it's one of those things that I feel like I'm naturally good at. I'm just drawn to the the bigger picture. Um, but I think that yeah. So for education, like in terms of the bigger picture, realizing like how many groups are out there like doing CS education. Um, you know, probably at least thirty that I'd have like written stuff written down. That I've done like a little bit of research into. What do you um, consider to be a group doing CS education? Like, I'm guessing you don't mean like a, a teacher or like. A, a no, no, no. Like I'm, I'm talking about like, sorry, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, to clarify, just um, like groups in terms of like VC backed startups. Okay. Right. Got it. Um, or, or so non profits don't count. Okay, no, no, or, non, or non profits, okay. right? And it's probably, probably, probably like with a non profit. More in that direction, I would think. It's probably hundreds. Um, and you can find lists, but like when I'm thinking about the groups that I want to compete with from a messaging and perspective, right? It would be the VC backed ones, right? Because it's one of those things where, you know, the, Right, the ones where they're actually trying to go out and hire the best engineers and hire yeah. pe and, and really think, you know, aggressively about moving into a market and like, you know, the urgency of the problem, whereas nonprofits are, you know, it's, it's I don't hard. think I'd do well in that environment personally. Yeah. Well, it, it just, I don't know, like, it, it seems like a lot of it's just about optics. And so, like, seems like at least donors don't really have direct eyes all the time on how their money is being used or what yeah. it's going to and so a lot of times the things that went out in the minds of you know NGOs or so I, I had a friend that had a water filter company and um, they raised about 1.6 million dollars in VC money um, and then they went under and returned the remaining money but the reason that they went under they had a really well engineered water filter um, 
and it was it was like super well designed. I mean, I, I hung out in the house for like all the founders loved a whole bunch, and you know, we we're really good friends. And um, but, you know, it's kind of under, so I don't feel like I'm violating NDAs by talking about this, and I'm not saying the name of the company. Yeah, but um, basically. Um, the reason it didn't go in, into a large scale buying, like, you know, the Red Cross didn't seem to want it, like, just non governmental organizations didn't seem to want it, was because it had a high unit price. And so, in the eyes of somebody trying to gauge their impact, you could say your $100 went to buy, you know, like 150 water filters versus your $100 went to buy, you know, 10 water filters. And maybe the 10 are actually going to last to provide cleaner water, but People don't think about it that way because they're so far removed from the user experience that they just want to see number of units. And that so, is such a, a wonderful, wonderful point. Um, you know, I, I've been, you know, my head is in, in the CS space and I know a lot of people who've gone to boot camps and... That's been an interesting phenomenon to observe. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess, you know, boot camps, you know, I'm thinking about this in terms of like, you go, you pay, you know, between five and $20,000 for yeah, kind of strikes me as a hustle. 16 weeks of like, we'll turn you into software engineer. None of those people are horrible at the end of it. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. That's kind well, of mean. Well, so, so, I mean, like, like in terms of, so, so like, let's actually, let's actually dig into that, right? Okay. So, like, you should dig into when I say something, right? And, or, or you know, I want to invite that. But, like, let's dig into when you say that, where does that come from? Where Because that, that is, like, right now, that's an opinion. But, like, where does, where, like, why does Spencer Krauss think that? Fair enough. I apologize. For Don't apologize. This is, this All is, right. this is awesome. <laughs> Like, like so, okay, so the experiences I've had with people that have graduated from boot camps is that I've been trying to hire for like more senior roles probably, yeah. and so it, it's just not a good fit for what I'm looking for in those How particular many? circumstances. I've probably interviewed about 50 people that have been out of boot camps. And what, um, what positions? So usually I get approached um, just when I'm kind of out meeting people at events. Yeah. and. I mean, just because of the nature of what SKA does and the types of projects I get involved in, it's a really advanced niche subject matter. So maybe it's just with regard to robotic software engineering. That's nope. not what they're teaching. They're teaching, you know, like yeah. JavaScript, C++, Python, but so, so fundamentals. This, this actually gets into some, some absolutely awesome space, right? Um, because, you know, I think you know, with a Carnegie Mellon background, right? Like it's something where I've got a certain perspective on what Carnegie Mellon gave me. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about thinking, um, which, yeah, that's, I guess it's a very much, philo I'm probably, you know, I talked about being a writer first. I'm probably a philosopher first, <laughs> but so, but, but like thinking about thinking, right? It's like, and, and like in computer science, there's a lot of discussion about um, computational thinking um, which I actually, I'm, I'm going to write about because I need to explore really the root of this, but like computational thinking is like, just an example is, um, there's this idea of sequencing, right? And that's, that's the thing that I hear people talk about most in relation to computational sequence, computational thinking. It's that there's this, that sequencing allows you to, or like teaches you, you need to put one thing in front of the other things come in a certain sequence. Uh -huh. Now, now the thing about this is like that I, I find really frustrating about that. And I don't know if it's just me trying to differentiate myself and, and my head, right? What, you know, be smart, but like <laughs> some of that, that happens. Um, but like, I, like one of the things I find frustrating is that like, there's no alternative, which is this discussion of when sequence doesn't matter. And I was thinking about this today, um, you know, in terms of like, brainstorming on this article sequ when sequencing doesn't matter right that is actually um, the understanding of that is responsible for I'm going to throw out a totally arbitrary insane hyperbolic number sure. it's responsible for 80% of the technological change in the past 20 years 
like like I'm and, and right now I'm going to go back a step. So I'm going to so so knowing when something when sequence doesn't matter. Okay. Is is responsible? So the 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 inverse of knowing, is it the inverse? Something so that almost like that. gets into like agile, like development. So so you can get there, but like that's not where I'm going. Okay. I'm going to like Google is, is like they built their core product on the idea of map reduce, right? Which is basically taking a big chunk of data and realizing oh, we can break that up and just do these things and then put them back like on a thousand different computers and put them back together later. This is the same thing where it's like, you know, when you're looking at Madden football on Xbox, right? What is a GPU doing, graphics processing unit doing, yeah. right? Rather, it's, it's basically figuring out, okay, what do I need to render? Okay, I'm gonna throw it at this, this chip that is so super awesome at parallel processing, and we're just gonna, you know, we're gonna use that thing. Um, and then, you know, when we look at AI, right? AI would not exist in its current form. It would not be possible without this concept of, of parallel processing, which we have just taken so far in the past 20 years. Yeah. And so, like, like this is one of those things where Sequencing is a great thing to be talking about, but then it's also like this understanding of when sequence doesn't matter. And and that in itself, right, like that's, well, that's one of those things that we miss. Um, and then this starts relating back to, I mean, for me, concepts of, of um, what would I say? I would say process and modeling, right? And that's process and modeling are the same thing as at Carnegie Mellon, they would have been called data structures and um, algorithms. Oh, interesting. Right, and, but process and modeling, I think is a little bit- So modeling is considered to be data structures and process is considered to be an algorithm? Yeah, and it's not quite so cut and dried because we yeah. model within data structures. So like we will, you know, in terms of like talking about, you know, like, you know, let's say a model for a car, right? A car has got four wheels, right? That's part of part of your model of what a car is. A car has four doors or two doors. That's part of your model. Um, and you might fit that into a different data structure, but that data structure itself, right? The low level data structures like linked lists, heaps, things like that. Those are, those are also models. Um, Interesting. And they're, they're just more generalized, right? So you can stuff any sort of thing into them. Um, but like thinking about and being able to move between those things, fit them together, composition, decomposition, pulling them apart, right? We don't talk of it. We, we're, we're throwing these words around like composition and decomposition. It's like put together, take apart, right? Much easier. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, you know, this is one of those things that, um, you know, like coming back to just like, yeah, throwing, throwing big words around you know, start thinking about abstraction. Well, what is abstraction, right? Well, like poetry's abstraction. Rap music is abstraction. Rap music's great, but yeah. So, <laughs> um, but but any any type of, of lyric is is abstraction. Um, any type describing any type of process is abstraction. Actually, you know, you've got, you know, let, let's talk about. Um, yeah, actually, here's an example from from a. a uh, this this great computer science teacher. Um, what would you do if I asked you to pour me a glass of water? Probably reach over to that pitcher and pour water into that glass over there. Yeah, um, and like, what if you broke? Could you break it down some more? Uh, extend my arm, uh, then lower it. Uh, well, I guess I would pitch it downward. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, probably extend some more. Uh, I'd be targeting the handle. Yeah. Um, do you want me to go to the kinematics of the arm or? No. <laughs> okay. But like, but like, it's so awesome that you can. But then, why do we say poor? What do you say, Spencer? Less effort just... than describing at a low level the actions involved right. in pouring a glass of water. Right. But it, and and with less effort is just as descriptive if we've got that context built up, right? We've got that context. I, I, we both agree on what it means to pour a glass of water. And I think yeah. so. So, so 
we use these things ever he, he uses that to describe why we use functions in computer science oh interesting okay um you know you, you and and you know i i would say yeah functions are one of those things where it's actually really hard i haven't heard of that many like i haven't heard of any single any like two line explanations right it's like the best explanations are explanations like that and some of that is because, like, I think all it is is naming the process of leaning over, extending your arm, doing that, right? And then even more abstractly, right, if that wasn't there and it was, it was on, you know, where you had to reach out with your left arm, right? Like, yeah. it's abstract enough that, you, you know, you could use your right or your left arm. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting how, well, yeah, I mean. It's interesting. I feel like I could be a lot better at abstraction, like. I'm very good with concrete examples and like tactical applications, but then when it comes to like thinking abstractly, I feel like my my brain isn't quite as uh, practiced. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I see, and this is one of those things. I'm not sure that this is a practice thing, and I'm not sure, but but I think it is, um, and I think some of it is probably. I don't know either. Yeah, yeah. I th I think some of it is. Um, and, and that's actually one of the things that, you know, with, with computational thinking um, and, and all this buzz around it, you know, we need to figure it out. Yeah. Um, but I do think that you, you know, you saying you don't, you know, you're not sure if your brain is good at abstraction. Like, I guess I'm going to say right now, like, I think everyone's brain is just, that's the magic. That's one of those big things that separates us from, from, you know modern modern ai right it's like it's like that abstraction right that's yeah. one of those things and um that makes us intelligent um i, don't I know guess i'm good at matching an abstraction to like different base examples once i understand the nature of the abstraction yeah which maybe i am good at it i don't know i i think human <laughs> beings are fantastic they are yeah, they're machines. Went, like, like this is this is one of those things we are really good at. Yeah. And actually, there is a uh, classification. That so that would be, well, so in the case of, so classification would basically wouldn't that be um, figuring out that that group of steps is actually pouring water. And then figuring out like if there's a different group of steps that could also qualify as pouring water. Right. And then, but then the like if I hit the button on the water fountain, that would also be pure pouring water. If I went over the sink and I twisted the thing, that would also be pouring water. Right, yeah. right, yeah. And then, like, actually, I've I've also heard someone say, um, one of my senior engineers at my last job, tell me that um, one of the two hardest things to do in software development is naming. Um, and from that perspective, right, like it's like coming up with the right name, which, which is the, the process we're talking about. Naming a function or naming, naming a variable? A, naming a function, but like that, that process of naming it is actually like packaging up the meaning, right? Yeah. Packaging up what it means to pour. Into one camel case thing. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 it's, it's, and, and then, you know, hanging your hat on it in the sense of like, um, people are going to have to interface with this name yeah. for the whole lifetime of the code. There are going to be five people. And if we change people. the interface, everybody's fucked. So right. know, let's, let's try to align on this. Let's get it right. Let's, yeah. let's think through it. So, so that's, I mean, and, and that's, that's why it comes up in computer science. And it's really important in computer science because you have to collaborate on these things. And like, also, if you do it wrong, right? The, com the program crashes or breaks, right? <laughs> or if you change the interface and don't tell anyone, the program for sure is going to break <laughs> because you're not going to have the link. That is, that is definitely one of those things, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. By the way, did you want to counter my, my kind of bearish view on uh, boot camps? I no, like no, no, no. Thank you. Thank, yeah, thanks for, for coming back to it. No, um, you know, like, like it's, it's fantastic to hear you say 50 people, right? You've interviewed 50 people and I would totally like, it's not a big sample size. No, like, no, no. Really that's, definitive. that's much bigger than my sample size. My sample size is probably three or four. Um, but like in terms of the three or four, I know, right? Like one was my cousin, one oh, was, cool. a, one is a friend. Um, and it's something where, and, and, and the rest is like compared against my intuition, right? Yeah. So this could all be confirmation bias, but I'm also, it's also like, there's also, yeah, I think I've got pretty solid intuition. 
Um, and I also have a, well, yeah. So, so I don't, I just don't think there's enough time to teach people the core things that they need to understand. Yeah. And, and the example that I would, I would sort of submit is the people I've talked to, like none of them can tell me what recursion is or, really? or can tell me that they ever knew it. And it's something where I talk about, talk to them about like, what is the curriculum related to recur recursion? Well, you know, we had it this one week. Jesus, we a week. Right. It's like, not enough time to grasp recursion. And, and they're, and they're, <laughs> and they're, right, because it's, it's like you practice it and you get so much better with it, right? Yeah. Um, and, and like you start, like, I probably didn't really, really. Do you use that in production code a whole lot? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, cool. I didn't, I, so I have a whole four year computer science degree. Um, yeah. And I, in undergrad, I doubled in computer science and business administration because my parents didn't want me to get a business degree, so I had to get the CS degree to yeah. justify it. Yeah, I mean, I'm helping with my tuition. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Basically, um, I uh, I got the CS and the business degree, and I remember um, I don't consider myself to be a qualified software engineer. I don't know shit about software engineering. Yeah. Uh, that degree is a totally different thing. Like I understand the fundamentals of computer science and. Yeah. I, I got good marks in all my classes and you know all that stuff or most of my classes I mean there's a few I didn't do so great in but um, you know for the most part like I don't think that knowledge translates directly so that's why I'm interested to get your perspective just for people you know yeah absolutely your too. no I mean I, I can I mean like I did a lot of document processing um, you know which would be yeah, and I, I would say, like, anytime you're you're looking at a document, right, especially, you know, anything nested where you don't know what the structure is going to be ahead of time. Oh, cool. That makes um, sense. Suddenly, suddenly you're you're immediately into recursion. I think you could break that out into loops, though, couldn't you, if you sort of like, wrote it recursively and then kind of back engineered it? Um, you probably can, but it's, it's something where it doesn't... There'd be while well loops that you'd have to break out of, like... It would have to be open-ended, I would think. Yeah, like, I, I, I don't remember ever actually choosing to do anything like that. Just in okay. terms of what I'm thinking about, it's like, you know, like, the places where I would get efficiency from, you know, would be, you know, keeping track of... If, if I'm traversing a document um, and I've got to go through, a, you know, a large set of nodes, right, you know, um, you know I'm going to try to keep track and make sure I don't visit... If I've already been to a node, right, yeah, and no information waste. about it, I, I'll, I'll save it. Um, and so from that perspective, you know, yeah, but, but yeah, I think you do, like, like yeah, you, use, you, you need to know recursion to, I think, write any sort of mean, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, like, blanket statement, but, like, it doesn't make sense to me. Like, I would have a hard time hiring someone who you know, at least wouldn't want to know about recursion. Okay, that makes sense. Um, you know, it's like, if they don't have it, like... When you're going to have to be willing to put in some training time and there's going to be a back and forth. Yeah. And so that's that's actually one of those things about boot camps that I think about. I, I think, I, I, my guess is that the successful ones um, have partnerships where they're so, actually saying, this is what our students are going to know. And and helping people figure out, oh, this is how you you actually onboard. So PNC them. it seems to be onboarding a ton of people on the local boot camps. I've noticed. Yeah. But I don't know what they're using them for. So I'd be I'd be really curious to kind of get more into that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's I suspect it's like super junior coding roles, but like I wonder what kind of stuff they've got them on. I feel like people get sort of stuck with SQL duty a lot of times in those circumstances. Yeah, but um, I don't know to what extent. See, see that that itself wouldn't make sense to me unless it's yeah, like yeah, that's not really what those programs focus on. But also, but also like pulling data out, right? It actually and getting the right data is is actually a. I mean, like you have to be good at it. Um, you know, from a modeling perspective, right? Like that's you really have to be solid. Like especially maybe less in terms of. If, you know, sort of coming up with new abstractions and understanding abstractions, but definitely composition, yeah. decomposition, um, understanding, you know, what... Putting things in and taking them out. Yeah, <laughs> Just but... Just to go back to your earlier definition. Yeah, maybe... Maybe... 
but but I think in terms of composition, right? In terms of like you know saying I've got this thing and this set of related things like PNC, you know I've got Spencer right, and he's got ten accounts right, yeah. making sure that the ten accounts come in, um, and you're not missing one right yeah. because that missing one has you know like some sort of funny I don't know yeah some funny data that, maybe it's that bigger than the number in the array that the mainframe is used to or something or I have no idea if they use mainframes if I they're think... if they're onboarding I would doubt they're onboarding That's a good point. Um, these Fortran really programmers <laughs> no idea um, I, I think banks are the only ones okay so maybe my knowledge is out of date but there's a guy in New Kensington which is a city outside of Pittsburgh yeah. for anyone listening from out of town who's got this thing that he calls the Large Scale Systems Museum, and I've donated them two robotic arms, but they've got mainframes from like the 1950s, like maybe the 60s. I think they have like a Heath kit from like further back, yeah. but then it goes to like 90s, and I, I there might have been an early 2000s mainframe, which I was surprised they still existed in the 90s. Like, you know, I guess IBM had, apparently they, I mean, according to this guy, they have a division that's still making them, and the only customer is banks. So I don't know. Um, that's kind of where that where that joke came from. But no, but but I think could be wrong. No, I mean I I'm, I would guess that that's true. Um, yeah, I, I could totally see that being true. But I'm guessing that that those are very specialized positions. Okay, so it might just um, be to support a legacy system, and nobody wants to fuck with their money, and so yeah, probably. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd be super curious about where where PNC is going with these folks, and and also like. You know, it could be if, if it is PNC or, or banks, right? It could be that they're they're thinking forward, right? They're thinking that oh, you know what? Like, the 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 junior engineers coming out of you know the MITs, the Stanfords, the Carnegie Mellons, right? They're gonna go to big tech. What we need to do is train, like, train people who aren't from that. Um, you know the, those cohorts yeah. um, and I think you know if they're doing that it's very forward thinking um, and honestly you know like we like it's pretty clear that Google and, and companies like that are have shortages yeah. and and my guess is that they they my you know this total guess right total speculation but I'm gonna say it anyway right my guess is they don't know how to source outside source talent outside um, those big those big schools just, right and they don't know how to grow talent yeah i mean it's it's difficult to grow talent it's it's expensive yeah. i mean it's risky it's um but it's also it's a huge effort like, but it's also essential you know this and this is education right sure and, no, and I maybe, maybe yeah. i don't, I don't be, disagree right I'm, maybe I'm it should be google's people. job right but yeah. but google should at least pay pay for a little more than they do yeah. um because they actually they, oh sorry i don't mean to cut no you no off. please always Are you sure Absolutely. I met a guy I yesterday on LinkedIn, yeah. and he reached out to me, and this is probably a bit, you know, douchey of me, but when somebody I don't know reaches out to me on LinkedIn, I don't, I don't, I'm just like, you know, how can I be of service to you today? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, and this guy, you know, is like, uh, apparently Amazon has an apprenticeship program now, which I thought was really cool and forward thinking, and like, yeah. it kind of reminded me a little bit of like what like the German automakers, you know, seem to be doing for a while. And they're training people, uh, like I sort of picked this kid's brain for a while. I say kid, he's yeah. in his 20s, I'm pretty sure, just from talking to him. But I, I picked this kid's brain for a while and um, you know, just tried to get his feel on what that program was like. And apparently they're teaching him like programmable logic controllers, which are like, it's outdated. If you're a you know, software engineer, you've been one, you, you're going to think it's totally, have you seen these things or tried to program one? It's all graphical. Like it's it's like a block-based programming language okay. that was designed for electrical engineers to be able to use it. Anyway, so the, those guys are in huge demand. There's massive shortages. It's popular in industrial automation. Um, so like, you know, tanning, bottling, moving packages around, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, and uh, you can't get enough of these people because the skills are kind of, you know, the, the workforce is retiring. Right. And so I thought it was sort of brilliant that they just started an internship program. They, they're teaching them how to program industrial robots. They're teaching them how to, you know, do uh, controls engineering. And, and the guy asked me, he's like, you know, like, what do you think I should do with my career? And I, I 
It's like, well, if, if you're just looking to make money, like he had to drop out of a bachelor's program because of some extenuating circumstance and then he ended up there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just like, if you're just looking to make money, if you learn controls engineering or like PLC programming, it's like, you could easily break six figures without a degree if you're good at it. Yeah. Like, you know, if you're solid, I mean, there's huge demand for that skill set. And I mean, I think that's, yeah, that's great. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of actually saying, for money, I think, you know, pe especially when, yeah, this is, this is one of those weird, weird spaces to be in, right? Because I have enough money that I have a little bit of room and cushion to sort of, you know, play around with what I actually want to do. And I realize how drastically like, like that is just a, it's a really weird position. It's a weird thing to talk to people about, especially when people don't have that. Um, and it's something where, you know, if someone doesn't have that cushion, right, I, I got to say, like, if you if you worry about safe, not safety, but like safety from the, the perspective of the hierarchy of needs, right, where where paying for food has been an issue, where so it's like you, Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah, okay. yeah. Where you, you don't have savings, right? Like, I would say, like, absolutely get that first. Like, that's one of those things that will you know, I think can, can help you sleep at night, um, which can then allow you to s go ask the question, like, what can I do? You know, can I go from here to go do something else that I really want to do? Yeah. Um, you know, de definitely like, you know, the cool thing about, yeah, like a computer science degree, or I've got an electrical and computer engineering degree. Um, nice. You know, I, I guess the cool thing about these, right, if they're from the right place, they've but I, and actually, maybe this isn't even it, right? I think, you know, having the confidence to, like, be able to jump into a new tool set yeah. and say, I'm going to do this and try this. But also, just being willing to put in the hours and admit if you fucked up and it's not the right approach, you know, and, and sort of move on to the next thing quickly. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to move on to the next thing quickly. It definitely <laughs> is, but it's valuable. I mean, I've not done it to my detriment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what are you doing these days? Um... So, I don't know, a few different things. I don't want to get into my personal life too much on here. Yeah, sure. But um, I'm trying to think. Okay, so I was thinking about spinning out a project. Um, so one thing, it's uh, a robot for the landscaping industry that I've considered trying to, yeah. to maybe get some VC funding for. So yeah. actually, I had coffee with a guy this morning uh, talking about that, maybe to raise a pre-seed round. I don't know if I would interact well with investors though either. Uh, sorry if you're listening. I, I think you're a nice person. That's <laughs> none of the investors I know, just other investors. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I was considering doing that. I've always bootstrapped everything I've undertaken in the past, so I feel like yeah. it would be interesting to see how it works with that nitrous injection of capital. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a few other things I'd rather not get into that are like a little bit more kind of I just haven't been public with yet. Yeah. But. That one, I think, is one that I've, I've been pretty open about, that I'm, I'm comfortable talking about. Yeah. And then, I don't know, I've been thinking about maybe uh, getting involved in the Ukrainian conflict in some way. So I've, I, mean, I don't want to get too political, but I've, I've always kind of been a little bit hesitant to get involved in defense work, even though I have plenty of friends that are veterans and have done that kind of work. And I think, you know, great of all of them that are my friends, because we're friends. But... And I, I just, I don't know, I, I have some moral quandaries sometimes with that kind of work, but I don't know. I mean, this particular war doesn't seem like I'd really have a whole lot of hangups helping, but then, you know, you don't know what people are going to use your stuff for, so I haven't really fully committed yet. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, it's cool that we can, you know, in, in some ways cool that we can help arm Ukraine with you know things that that can help them defend their I mean it's fighting for their lives yeah um, for sure. and and do you want, want a glass of whiskey by the way um if you want yeah I'll, I'll take a little bit sure. this, this is uh from Pennsylvania okay fantastic Philadelphia, Philadelphia whiskey it's uh it's, it's pretty good. good cheers cheers but, but yeah, yeah, that's kind of how I feel about it, right? It's like, uh, you, you feel, feel good supporting an underdog. underdog. <laughs> <laughs> but also some of the weapons that they're using, um, like they're just, I mean, they're, they're, they're really terrifying in the sense of, 
how portable lethality, port, portably lethal they are. Yeah, um, kind of like javelin rockets. Or... Less that, right? Like, you know, that's going to blow up a car. You know, thinking about like these um, maybe switchblade drones or something like that. Oh, right? interesting. I don't know a whole lot about those, actually. Like, yeah. end, I've heard. Like these tiny little just good, good things, things. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. like you know, it's it's something where it's like this this little canister. You just put it on the ground. You launch it. It goes and it goes and kills someone. Like who's half a mile. What's the away. armament on it? I think it's like it. Sh I don't. I think it like shoots like bullets or something equivalent to a bullet. Okay. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where it's just like you know that's you know it's. These are things that we're rapidly being able to, like, I, I think people are, are, you know, makers are going to have the technology to do this. Oh, we already do. I mean, like, they, did you see the ISIS videos that were coming out a few years ago of, like, Hobby King drones? Like, no. with armaments improvised on them? Yeah. And, and so, yeah. And, I mean, the weird thing is... With like, Hobby King logos, like, on the film. Really? You, was, I, don't, I hesitate to say funny, but, I mean, in a... Well, macabre kind of way. You know, a friend of mine says, um, if you're not laughing, you're crying. Amen to that. Um, and and actually, you know, that's one of those things that, yeah, not a lot of men cry. Um, so it's one of those things where, yeah, I, I mean, like even, even talking about this, right, like I, I hear some of your interest in the armament and it's something where... I remember growing up with watching Wings on Discovery Channel um, and like you know, stuff related to, like, yeah, like, weapons and, like, military history, and it's, like... Well, some of the most advanced engineering is, is in that direction, so... Yeah. I mean, it's a harbor specialist wet dream, you know, just from a technical perspective. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's also... Yeah, I mean, it's... It's weird how it sort of gets in and sort of, you know, pull... I think it's pulling at something psychological... Um, either and, and maybe it's like societally driven, right? But but maybe it's also something a little more innate. Um, and you know, but like when I think about this sustainability concept, right? You know, I think, you know, like that is not something we can do with eight billion people um, without basically running the risk, like a, a huge risk that like this is going to impact us in Pittsburgh. And something where, again, when we think about this, right, it's like, you know, it shouldn't, like, there's this self-serving side to making the world a better place for everyone. Yeah. It's it's very much like, oh, you know, and that that's, you know, that's that's empathy. I'm just thinking um, of George Carlin's, like, quote on, like, the world needs more bicycle paths. <laughs> I guess <laughs> I don't know that safe for their Volvos. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's great. Um, I was actually thinking the world does need more bicycle paths. <laughs> no, they're great. Um, I love biking. Yeah, like I would do yeah. it. I would actually bike in the city if if there was a safe a way to do it without cars. Well, there are bike lanes, but I guess cars encroach on them all the time, yeah. and they just don't go like all the places you need them to go. Yeah, have you ever been to like the Netherlands? I haven't. I feel like that's the most advanced bicycle. Yeah. Like to the point where like people on bikes are kind of arrogant, like like they'll fucking hit you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've heard of the Dutch reach, which is this idea that when you're getting out of your car, instead of um, opening your door with your left hand, um, you you open with your right, and that gives you the peripheral vision to actually sort of swing your head around and take a look to make sure there's no biker coming. Oh, smart. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess it saves lives, but you know, related to probably all the all the bikes. Yeah, I've been to Montreal. And I have not. I would like to go. I've heard there's a direct flight either opened up or opening up through Air Canada there. So I, I definitely, I, I have no idea, but um, like maybe it's a sub subsequent hang. Great biking city. <laughs> um, great biking city yeah and and like have just a ton of bike lanes that are they're along the normal road right but like as like an asphalt barrier with like these like plastic pins that like separate it from the cars yeah which i mean you're not going to hit that with your car if you're conscious so. right right you and might if you're texting but. yeah yeah <laughs> a lot of texting drivers <laughs>
One of the things you were talking about before was um, was management and sort of managing managing people. Yeah. And you'd been talking about um, sort of this idea of of encouraging people to to sort of leave the team. Um, yeah. If they wanted to. Well, I think that's the key thing for like I've never told somebody they should leave one of my yeah. teams unless they were yeah. negatively impacting the team, but. Um, yeah, no, no, no. I, I think getting behind people's decisions and supporting what's yeah. best for them is, is important because I mean, also like people tend to remember that, right? So like even from a self-serving perspective, like if yeah. you don't support them, they're still going to leave, right? You know, and and now you're just the asshole that tried to stop them. But if you do support them, you know, I mean, yeah, maybe you'll work together in the future. I mean, they'll say better things about you just from yeah. the self-interest perspective, like then empathy comes in, right? And there's a whole nother plethora of reasons to do it, so. Right, well I love the, I, you know, like this is called collaborative and I don't know, I, I'll ask later like where you got that name, but like. It's a lot of brainstorming. <laughs> okay, I mean, I mean, I, like collaborative is one of my, one of my favorite, actually it hasn't made the list of my favorite words. I actually have a list of favorite words, but it's definitely like near and dear to my heart. Um, <laughs> You know, I think making sure it was in frame. <laughs> yeah, what, what, like, like when I when I was, yeah, and this is this is a weird thing to sort of reflect on. It's like when when we played video games in college, I was always all for like the co-op games. Yeah. Right, and like I need to have a team, and I need to work with that team. I do so much better in that format than I do like as like an individual contributor or whatever. Yeah, and, and it's something, I, I just like that, like being able to work with people, even if you're working against people, right? Like where it's yeah. two teams or, you know, but I, I, I You don't usually, want to let the team down. What's that? So you don't want to let the team down. Exactly. <laughs> no, and, and that's a, it's a weird thing. Like, um, yeah, and haven't, haven't figured out where that comes from. Um, it's tribalism probably. Maybe, I th but, but a lot of people like that sort of, that death match, one on, you know, one on one or every man for himself, every yeah. person for themselves. But a lot of people also like, you know, like coding at a desk by themselves too. Like maybe yeah. it's just like an introversion, but I don't think that's it because I don't know. I wonder, I have no idea. I, I'm, yeah, no idea. But like coming back to that, that idea of management, right? Um, I think one of the things that I really, really took on in the past few years was like when I was managing, um, was doing one-on-ones and, and really, you know, just the idea that you're checking in with people, you're finding out how they're doing at a personal level. Um, and some of that is, you know, you can say it's self-serving, right? But um, in that, and, and there's part of it that is, but like, like there's this duality to it that it's also like it's building this relationship and building trust and like it's something where i remember there was someone who i was managing who um you know was going through a really tough time um at home had home issues and something where like by by engaging in those human problems um was able to i was able to really sort of figure out how to communicate to the team without giving too much information away and, and you know, kind of like, like making sure that he was, you know, I was not crossing any boundaries by sharing something with the team, but then also like help, ha helping figure out like who can fill in gaps yeah. that he, he wasn't able to fill in. And like that from a leadership perspective, like my take on leadership is, um, you know, 10% at most should be you actually leading. That's crisis management. That's like, no one is ready to step up. You've got a huge problem. I'm gonna be the, I'm gonna be the one to do it, right? I'm gonna be out leading in front. Yeah. But 90% of it is making sure you, you're, you're watching the gaps and you're watching the people and you're getting them to fill those gaps. And then, you know, you might be able to actually like reserve a little gap for yourself because you really enjoy that part of the work. Yeah. Um, but you need to make sure that, you know, if you go on vacation, everything is covered. And that's the thing, like by going, by doing that, you get to go on vacation and be comfortable um, that everything is going to get done. Um, and I've, I've heard recently, you know, people talking, Beautiful. I actually took a course about coaching and leadership coaching um, and I absolutely just love it like it totally 
you know, it's maybe it's confirmation bias, but it's one of those <laughs> things where it's like, actually, you know, like, yeah, I listened to, to Brene Brown's Dare to Lead, um, which is Brene Brown's Dare to Lead. Is that like a podcast? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. Brene Brown is a, a psychologist and she does a lot of work with emotion. If you like were to Google her, like you'd see stuff about shame. Yeah. But she's really related it to the business world. That's awesome. Um, and has a fantastic business going. Um, and she is she like she has the abs some of the absolute best. So it's B R E N E E R E N E. Yeah. Brown. Yeah. And so she's she's it's a bit of a she's like kind of famous in in leadership definitely psychology circles right is definitely probably a top 10 pop psych person cool um but she but but she has these absolutely fantastic people and they all almost all like to a person come back to this idea of um how important emotion is um that we're all emotional beings and and you need to treat people that way and you need to take into account their feelings um, even though, yeah, you're, you're there to get a job done. Um, and I think, you know, with coaching, coaching is a lot of it is in terms of thinking about the feelings, right? It's about, um, making sure people feel good about their work, yeah. making sure people know what they're doing and like why it's going to make a difference. Um, making sure that you are a partner who's enabling them, right? The way like a coach, a really good coach. Yeah you know, isn't, isn't going to make a play on the field, right? Like in the end, when the players go on a field, the players are gonna make the plays, but the coach is basically helping them figure out how do I spend my days training for what's gonna come? How do I spend my days, you know, figuring out how to interact and build relationships with these team members? That's awesome. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things where like that totally fits for me. And so what you're saying about sort of what you grew into about like, you know, like encouraging a, um, you know, a team member who wants to leave, right? Saying, you know, like if this is what you want, if this is your growth path, yeah, right? I think that that's, that's absolutely fabulous. And if they've done good work, like I'll even give you a recommendation, you know? <laughs> right, right. And I mean, too, like, like the better you are at your job, right? Like the less likely they're gonna wanna be to leave yeah. But it's also something. Well, sometimes you, just an opportunity comes up. Like yeah. I had one guy leave to go to Meta, yeah. You know, which like I can't pay him what Meta's paying him. Like, <laughs> so yeah, it kind of made sense. I had a guy for nine months who was one of the one of the people I clicked with most, um, and he just yeah and yeah I mean he was one of those guys who he was going to move on to to a different path um, and and was motivated by different things than me, but. Um, yeah, something where, like, you know, like, when he wanted to leave, I did what I could to sort of encourage him to stay, right? Like, yeah. trying to figure out how do I, how do I tweak the heart strings? Smart. Um, and, and, you know, it was all about, you know, what our, what our differentiation really was, you know, there are ways that we can change the world that might save the life of someone he loves. Um, yeah. In the end, he went on to, to do Google Shopping. It's like, ah. Uh. There's another guy. I, I, He's probably making a million dollars a year right now. Holy shit! That's but 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 really it's like <laughs> like with 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 a million dollars a year. If you've been making it for a few years, you got to start asking yourself, what is my number? Like because <laughs> yeah, you got to you got to start asking that because when you say what is my number, like, like at what point am I going to be happy with it? What, at what point does does that not matter? Yeah. And, then, and then it's a question of like. What are the problems I'm working on? And I hope it's a question of what are the problems I'm working on? Yeah. You were gonna say? Oh yeah, it's a, another guy that I, I sort of like kind of helped on with like some next steps in his career. Came in as a contractor on a project um, that I can't discuss, but I can say is in this very yeah. room. Yeah. And uh, he did some incredible work. Like he just, yeah. he was there in a rescue role and he came in, I think he might've even still been a student, but yeah. he came in and just did some he pulled long hours, he, he did some crazy shit, and he got a system that might not have worked otherwise to, to work in a certain way. He, he helped build a, um, a piece we needed. And I mean, he, 
him and I have been working together for probably close to a decade now in some yeah. capacity or another. I helped him get a job at the Carnegie Mellon Field Robotics Center. Yeah. From there, he went on to Raytheon. From there, he went on to NASA. And then he's come back and worked with me on other projects. So, nice. Yeah, it was great. Like, he actually came to Pittsburgh. He's now at the University of Michigan getting a PhD uh, in bioengineering. It's like a totally different thing. Yeah. Um, so he's doing like uh, artificial organs. Yeah. But he... Um, and he's helped me out with software problems. He's helped me out with hardware problems. He's helped out with mechan electrical harnessing. He's a brilliant guy. Yeah. And um, I, I love this guy so much. Like, he lives in a van, you know, and he's, he's totally Spartan and minimalistic. But, you know, he is, uh, I don't know. I, I think he's, he's an interesting dude. Um, but where's he going to go with that? Um, oh, he came to Pittsburgh on his way to University of Michigan to teach yeah. me how to ride a motorcycle for a trip to Southeast Asia. Oh, that's so like, cool. I'm probably going to be friends with this guy forever. <laughs> so, or at least See, until we're both dead. <laughs> I mean, I think that's... Or one like, of us is dead, rather. That's one of those things, right? Like when, you know, I guess that brings up the, a really important word um, that actually needs to make my top words. Um, relationships, right? And, you know... Yeah, like this idea that, you know, I could be, could be at home, right, writing code or, or doing other things, right, um, you know, furthering sort of what I want to do, but, like, I also realize, like, coming and chatting with you, right? Yeah, like I'm grateful it's, that you did. It's relationships. It's, um, it's really fun to talk to people um, and, and, yeah, be able to chat about, like, what, what makes us different, what makes us the same, and I think you know you like helping that guy right it's like you know right it's i mean i think it's innate he's also helped me quite a bit I well mean. well right but it's <laughs> it's some yeah and and i think that that's like one of these interesting things right we both earned each other a decent amount of money too in the interim i mean it's but it's it also been... comes back around and you know like you didn't necessarily know about the money. And you yeah. just, like one of the things that you well, said- Well, business was the first thing we kind of bought it. Well, no, 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 yeah. even before that, we met through the Carnegie Mellon Robox Club. Yeah. And it was, it was kind of a mutual interest in the, in the technology at first. Yeah. But I mean, the fact that you, you know, you keep a relationship and he came and like, there wasn't any, I, I assume there wasn't anything monetary in him teaching you how to ride a motorcycle. No, I mean, so like that's you know that's a relationship and that's one of those things where it's like you know like it sucks when yeah i mean bail on relationships where people keep score um you know <laughs> do, you, you do need i feel to, like there's there's a back and forth there because like reciprocity i think is somewhat that's on my list what do you mean reciprocity is on my list of words what, what's your list of words? I'm oh, sorry. I, I think I've mentioned it a couple of times. I've got a list of like favorite words. Nice. Reciprocity is on it. I think I don't think it's necessarily a wholly bad thing. Like I think. Yeah. Like, I think it's it's kind of so that's why it's interesting. Like keeping score, I guess, is one thing. If you're like going down to the right. dollar or to the hour or to the, you know, but like at the same time, I mean, like I don't know. There, there's, I, I have a mentor that I've been talking to for like probably seven years at this point and every week we spend about two hours on the phone and, and just talking about you know different business challenges that I'm up against and at this point it's gone beyond that like we're just friends yeah. but you know it's I mean he's helped me get through some really really challenging scenarios and, and advance my career much faster than I would have otherwise been able to and he was keeping score for the, he's like I'll, I'll tell you what my deal is it's an hour for an hour you know, and that was his proposition to me. And he gave me that deal. Like, I was way too young to deserve it. Like, I was, I was kind of still in grad school. And, you know, he offered me that. Actually, I don't know if I was still in grad, but I was, like, freshly out. And he offered me that. And, um, you know, I... I but there, there's something special about that, right? Like, knowing that an hour for an hour, knowing that his time... Is way more valuable than mine. Yeah. <laughs> or and, at least and, was. Mine's and, getting more valuable, but... And I love that. Yeah too like and and maybe there's like I, I really like the idea of duality right like you can look at things looking at things different ways so like score when someone is like yeah always you know yeah i mean i've definitely had relationships in my life right ones that i've walked ultimately walked away from likewise um that 
were ones where in the end I realized like I was getting a lot less out of it than I was giving. Yeah. And it wasn't like this keeping score. Oh, you do this. I do this. You do this. I do this. Right. But it definitely, a lot of times it felt like that person was looking at it that way. Ah. But then a lot of the things that I would do wouldn't be put into the ledger. And annoying. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, and, and, and for a long Discardious, time... Discardious, maybe a better word. <laughs> for, for a long time, it was just like, you know, you just, you just deal with it and you sort of move on and sort of this selfless, want this relationship to work sort of way. Um, and then, then at some point you realize, wow, this is, this is actually, like, this is not good for me. And, yeah. and then you, you, yeah, and if you can actually make that choice to leave... Okay, that's that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. But like, what you're saying is like a really special relationship. Um, you know, there's this guy who who's like, um, you know, we're we're talking with, I'm talking with about entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, he's 23. Um, he is, you know, I would say, yeah, he he just has so many less advantages than I do. Um, you know, one of the, like, like from background to like a really basic one is, you know, like I had two tires that I had that, that were basically leaking air and, and basically need to be replaced. And all I do is, you know, I go and I pay for it and, and get it done. Yep. Right? And he does not have the money to do that. Yeah. And so he's dealing with having to, you know just constantly deal with a tire that's that's not totally flat ah, that you can fill up that's brutal that's brutal like right. especially when you're trying to be an entrepreneur and you've got other problems and reliable transits keeping you from getting those things done right so yeah. but but so like our interactions right like it's very much you know he was he was asking you know asking me to be a mentor or like referring to me as a mentor and I was taking the approach of, you know, no, you know, you, he's got a lot of mentors. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's like, no, you know, we're going to be friends. Yeah. Like, and what that means is, you know, I just want to be clear, right? I learn as much from you as you do from me. And when we think about equity, right? You know, yeah. like when I, like, he is a person who, who could use a little fucking equity. Um, yeah. Could Sounds use like a it. little bit of advantage. Um, and it's something where for me, it's, you know, like that, that, that to me is incredibly valuable to see his perspective, to see what he is struggling with and like to realize, yeah, my kids aren't going to have to struggle with that because like either my or my ex are going to take, help them, you know, for me, it's probably going to be doing what I'm doing for this entrepreneur, which is like figuring out how do I, how do I set up a situation, right? Where they're able to learn. Yeah. Right. And they're able to take care of something themselves. Can you give an example of one of those? Mm. I'd just be curious to see how you did that. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the one I'm working on right now, which I'm, I'm not sure I need to follow through with is, um, you know, this entrepreneur is working with a nonprofit in the area. That nonprofit um, changed sort of how they were basically changed their leadership and his deal with them fell apart. Ah, uh, it sucks. Um, and basically, you know, like one of the things I just did, like just in the past week was like reach out to them and like, basically like, s like ask, like you're, you're, you know, basically read their charter and be like, there's this guy over here who totally got, totally got screwed. Right. And, and, you know, didn't say it that way, but it, you know, it fits with the spirit of your mission to go ahead and help him out. And the person's response was, oh, you know, really sorry that that happened. Um, you know, let's set up a call and, and talk about it. Nice. And so for me, you know, it's it's really figuring out, um, okay, you know, if I do this, like, do I tell him, you know, oh, look at what I've done for you, right? Um, or do I, like, figure out, you know, how to basically set up a situation where he makes the same call and the same plea, oh. right? Right, where he, where it's like, dude, you know, like, go ahead and reach out to them and like tell them what you know like look at their website tell them Do why you think yeah. they would fit right and and why they should help you um 
in, in which case it would be a situation where, you know, that's, that's a little bit leading, but it's also one of those things where I think it's significantly better than me saying, oh, I just did it for you. Yeah, for um, sure. Teach and, your mind to fish. Right. Right. Yeah. But like, it sounds like you still helped him out and then you kind of gave him all the pieces and... Well, so it's, it's figuring out, right, yeah, what are the things... It's hard to find that line a lot of the time for me. Yeah. And I, I think, in, you know, in the professional world, right, sometimes you're just going to model it, right? Like, yeah. like you know, I think modeling is a, is a really important thing. It's like, just like leading by example and yeah. showing how to do the thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan of that approach. And then nudging, sometimes it's like, you know, I guess Nudge is a book about choice architecture, but, you know, it can also be, you know, just like, yeah, like, go ahead and do that, right? And that's kind of what this would be. Um, so I, I'm not sure this is this situation is going to work out, but it was just an example that's like just in my head, right? Yeah. He's he's actually been looking for alternatives, and from that perspective, right? If he finds alternatives um, on his own, you know that's even better. Yeah. Well, I would say both approaches in parallel probably is is the ideal, which it sounds like you guys yeah. are doing. Yeah. But I mean, and then I, I learn just a ton from him and. Yeah, watch him and some of his struggles and see those struggles in me and hopefully can you know, hopefully he sees some of my struggles in him um, yeah. yeah so yeah that's, that's awesome yeah it's but I mean you know it's it's one of those things where it's it's all about the relationship right yeah. it's like you know no money's changing hands you know and, and but it's it's also like 20 years of experience versus almost no experience right and something where it's like but you know, I do, I do take the approach and maybe your, your, um, you know, your men, I don't know if you mentor, friend right? Tour, but friend, friend, friend tour, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe he like saw, you know, so, you know, is looking at it similarly, right? In terms yeah. of, yeah, seeing something in Spencer where he was like, yeah, like this is, this is something that I need. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, there's definitely something in it for him, right? And I, I think yeah. it's the satisfaction of, you know, seeing somebody do these things and just being able to help out when I've since gone on and I've done some of the things that he's done for me for other people in my life and you know kind of tried to pay it forward in that way and um, yeah. so like one thing that he helped me out a lot with toward the, the beginning of um, my work in contract engineering was contract negotiation and he's like you can spend so much money on lawyers you know and, and you should when you have to but a lot of this stuff is more navigable than you think, you know? Yeah. So he kind of showed me how to analyze a contract and which, and my mom's also a corporate litigator. So I had the advantage of her mentorship there as well. And, um, so between those two, but he notices things she doesn't like he'll, she'll look more for like syntactical things or like choice of law, choice of venue or like, you know, just stuff that's like almost grammatical, you know, whereas he'll look for like, you know, what is the overlying purpose of this contract? Why does it matter in the context of the business relationship? What are the consequences if it blows apart? You know, and, and so it's all really valuable. Um, like between the three of us, like we've held down, I, I won't say the names of the other stakeholders involved, but like we, we've held down, you know, like successful contract negotiations with pretty big fish yeah. and, and come out with an advantageous position. And so, I've tried to pass on some of those skills to, to other people um, that I've kind of, you know, let's say taken under my wing, but, you know, that have asked me for help in similar ways and that I've been happy to give it to. And, you know, it's a pain in the ass. Like, it's a lot of work to go through someone else's contract. And I reflected that to this other guy. And I'm like, hey, thank you for doing that. Like, I, I did that for a friend recently, and it's, it's brutal. Like, it's just really arduous work. He's like, yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly, exactly how I felt when I was doing it for you. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Thought, thought it was kind of, it's always good to see a mirror and to see, you know, the other perspective. I mean, yeah, empathy, yeah, I think you kind of cut right into it. it. I definitely, I, I would absolutely be one of those people to be looking at it at the high level, right? Like looking at, do you have, yeah, the right controls in? Is there anything in there that is like egregiously like, one one sided. Oh, we had, oh so, sorry. I and I, I, I and and really like I find myself yeah. I hate it when I have to go through like with a fine tooth comb. Yeah. I kinda, I kinda like, like it in a way. Like it's, it's almost, almost like a hobby. hobby. 
Like, like sometimes, sometimes it's fun to just read someone the riot act when they've handed you a document like that. <laughs> but like it can be it can be frustrating when you've got like a really really full backlog too. Like I, I don't know, it can be. And I've walked away too at times. I mean, we all have. I think yeah. when something's too egregious. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, actually, when I think about contracts right now, I I, I, uh, I got a contract basically for a. It's for a kids' field trip at school, <laughs> right? And it's like it's like in Florida. What? No, no, no. This is this is in Pittsburgh for my kids. Oh, like, okay. Going to this like um, yeah, this like ropes course in Ohio. And basically, it says something to the effect, it, you know, it uses the word indemnify. Oh, which I'm gonna never want to sign anything with that word. I'm going to say, right, yeah, right, well, well yeah, and, and like, and then the alternative is that your kid does, kid's the only one who doesn't go on the field trip. Uh, um, and is that, is that enforceable, though? Because I feel like if, you yeah, can't. Like, and, then, and, then it's, and then it's also things like, you can indemnify um, the fucking school if your kid gets killed. Like, if I, right. And if like I, you're going to pay for their legal defense. <laughs> and if, and, 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 then, well, well, and I guess the thing that I'd, I, I think is really annoying about that and, and like sad about that is I'm going to say, you know, 98% of the people out there will not know what that means. Right, and then, and that's a totally arbitrary number. It's just, I'm just guessing. You're probably right. Like, like that's, that's that's something I didn't know what it meant for like until you, like, until you like looked at a contract that actually was was like meant something to you, or had a lawyer who was like, and you were able to. That was I had to have a lawyer tell me. And you asked like, what the hell does that mean, right? Yeah. What's what's that mean? And yeah, that like, was, oh, I was because I, I was going through line by line. line and I circled it. And I'm like, what is this? Right. And then I got an anecdote. <laughs> right, like, and, and um, you know, the other side to it, like, along with the indemnification was, like, basically saying, if anyone on our side is negligent, you still can't sue us. Yeah, and so well, not only that, but, like, you're, you're going to have to take, take the brunt, brunt of it legally. legally. Like, like I, I'm pretty, like, I guess my mom was the first one to tell me what that means. Yeah. And it was in a contract uh, with a much larger company that we were negotiating. You hate to say against, but I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. And, and um, you know, know, we were negotiating this contract with them, and there was an indemnity clause in there, and she said, let me tell you a story about an indemnity clause that I was once privy to. So she worked for a company in New York um, that was an uh, engineering and design firm of some kind. I think they were, like, making product. And then they went to contract manufacturers. They had it manufactured. So anyway, they made this kid's picnic table. They went to an Italian contract manufacturer. The contract manufacturer in Italy sent an indemnity clause and so my mom's job for like a year when the lawsuits rolled in because the spitting table would amputate kids' pinkies when closed a certain way, was to call up the Italian contract manufacturer who didn't design it. All they did was make the thing that they had been handed the prints for. But I mean, this was in the 70s, it was a crazy time. But and they were like, hey, you got another lawsuit, click. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's like that, it's pretty egregious. But I think, yeah, and, and you know, I think the you know, asking people to, you know, and there's this expectation that, really, that people sign it, right? Like, you're gonna put that in a kid's field trip, like this negligence clause, which is separate from indemnity, right? I can do anything I want, right? I can, I can, you know, leave your kid on the bus and like, leave the, par leave the bus on a hill, turn the parking brake off, bus rolls down the hill into a lake, right? Not well. my problem. I mean, that's, that's negligence, right? Yep. I mean, I, I don't know if it's... Well, that's impossible. probably willful misconduct at that point. It, it's probably criminal. Yeah. But, but also it's something where, like, without a lawyer, I'm not qualified to, like, understand or look at that, right? Which I think actually works in your favor with some of the precedent on those sorts of But it also points to this, like, this culture of mistrust Right, this idea that oh, like like there was a, probably a lawyer who told that com the company that runs the rope course that hey, you know, over in this other state, at one point someone got sued because and so we recommend that you put this stuff in. Yeah. Right, and then then people who are you know sort of who don't have lawyers, right, because none of us like really retain lawyers and shouldn't have to. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that would say something even worse about society, right? Um, I, you know, we're, it's embarrassing how many lawyers I have on my phone. 
But I mean, but from I'm a bit, from a business, more distrustful person than most. Yeah, from a business perspective, you know, it, it makes some sense. Well, but you don't want to bring them in all the time. Like that's that's almost like a last resort. Like that's it should be yeah. right. And and this is where yeah, I mean this this problem with. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I should I, say I've never been sued. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I need to qualify that statement. <laughs> I, I just don't know how to solve yeah. this this issue of distrust, right? My my, you know, personal trainer also made me sign a contract that talked about negligence, and it's like, did you maybe like, and, and correct me if you know this is like, I don't want to like mansplain, but like, did you? consider xing out the clause and just initialing it and then signing it and saying hey it all looks good except clause 3a you know can we maybe just strike that i did i chatted with him about it um you know like in the end i i'm convinced he's not like you know i'm going to take care of my safety in the gym like yeah. i don't think there's anything he's going to do or position he's going to put me in where where I'm gonna be at risk. That makes sense. Um, and from that perspective, you know, like I think he's, yeah, he's, I, I understand that. I just wish like as, as a society, we were significantly less litigious. And, yeah, it sucks. And more into like having these discussions about like, how do we just make this right? How do we make, how do we get this back to a good relationship? Um, well, it's good that you're actually like willing to go with it and just see past the lack of malice there, because I've definitely walked away from relationships that I don't think, I don't think the other party had malice, but the contract language I just couldn't reconcile, and so like if it yeah. struck me as a little too far from what I was comfortable with, you know, I mean, I almost, you know, I just don't want to, I don't want to go any further, you know, it's a yeah. Yeah, but I feel like I've missed out on stuff as a result of that. Hmm. I mean, anything life changing? Not really. Nothing horrible. Just having to maybe find a different service provider for like a thing. Okay. Like, yeah. I, yeah. Like a therapist I couldn't see because I didn't like her contract language. What in terms of therapy? Like, what would the language? It was. It was just something like you know, like you have no privacy within the context of this. You know, like I'm generalizing, but. It was basically like I can share your information for any reason I want, and I was like, I'm not really comfortable. With did that. you talk with her about that? I did, and she she initially seemed willing to consider my perspective, and then later said that you know it was a boilerplate that she didn't want to stray from. Okay. Yeah, boilerplates. Yeah. I don't know if she used the word boilerplate. That's more. Me. No, no, no. But but they do right. Like I mean, yeah. I I I went to a massage therapist once that had in, indemnification in the in the like. I forget what it was, but it was like a description of, do you have any health problems? Will you indem please indemnify us against? It's but like, I feel like indemnification is, is so much more than, you know, like just saying, like like you said, the release of liability. Like that's that's a step back from indemnity. Yeah, yeah the, the massage therapist didn't actually know what, what it, it meant. What it meant. That doesn't surprise me. But then, then was willing to go with it. And, and yeah, may, I mean, I don't know. Maybe so you got the clause just, struck in this case? No, I just let it go. Yeah, it's fair. Like, it's what am I going to do? Like, go home. On. It took me two weeks to get this appointment. It's like, <laughs> like, what, what, who's I've actually... I've done that before. I've, I've <laughs> who's actually going to sue in this case? I didn't walk into, I won't say which company, but like a, a Fortune 5 company that I was trying to do some work with because I thought their NDA yeah. was too overreaching. Like, they wanted... Okay, you can't have your own secrets under the clause of this NDA... But we can. Um, but we can. Everything we say is a secret. Anything right. that we talk about, you're not allowed to speak about us publicly in any context. Yeah. Um, and then there was like, I think those were like the three things that were ridiculous. And they gave me the NDA to review 30 minutes before the site visit. And in that time, I looked it over in my car. I called my mom up and then I called a separate contract attorney that I pay by the hour to also look at it. Because I don't want to miss the opportunity unnecessarily, but I'm just like, you know, am I that yeah. crazy or are these it's also clauses I shouldn't be agreeing to? You know? Yeah. It's also snowing. We own, right, we own everything that's said here. Um, yeah. And yeah, but like I own, I own everything I knew before. And yeah. I'm not, and, and then they're asking you to like write it down. Write down everything you know. So I'm um, never going to be able to fill out that appendix. Like, that wouldn't be right. practical. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I know a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, like, like that's, that's actually something. I, the, what I think about is really the power differential in those situations. Yeah. Right? Well, you I think a lot of it's posturing, like you said. Yeah. But the problem is when you're in a corporate setting, it becomes very enforceable because you're expected to have the resources to do your diligence. Whereas I think if you're in a consumer setting, you're not really held to that same standard um, insofar yeah. as I understand the legal precedent. No, and, and I think that makes sense. But I also think that there is... I don't know I don't, I don't like companies that do business that way, right? In terms of yeah, um, I'm not a fan either. Obviously, I didn't walk into the into the room. Yeah, yeah. So, so was that something where you traveled to get to the site visit? Luckily, it was um, it was local, so I didn't have to. I'm now I'm probably outing who it is. <laughs> no, 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 you didn't. Yeah, fair enough. I'm yeah, everybody's got a satellite office here. Yeah, everyone. Yes, yes, yes. the top five companies in the world, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I mean, I didn't sign it, but you know, I still don't want to tempt fate. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, um, yeah. Those are interesting, right? Because like sometimes, yeah, knowing where to where to put your risk tolerance, right, and knowing where to not. Because yeah, clearly there was something inside inside you telling you not to do it. Just all sorts of red flags for like run. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't run. I, I walked in and said, hey, can we maybe do something about these three clauses? I don't like them. Yeah. And two different lawyers agree. <laughs> so yeah, and they said no. They said we'll get back to you, and then they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's all good. Yeah. So what are you watching? Anything? In terms of like TV shows? Yeah. I've, I like the Mike Tyson Mysteries. I don't know if you've seen this. No. What is this? Okay, so it, it's pretty great. It's an animated show that's in the style of Scooby-Doo. And it's Mike Tyson, um, an 18-year-old Korean woman, a talking pigeon that's also a sex addict Perfect. and an alcoholic, played by Norm MacDonald, and um, a ghost that is, like, closeted gay, but, like, very... Over, like he, He's obviously gay. He's, like, from the Victorian era. Uh, and he's played by the guy that voices the dean from Community. And so um, mm. it's it's a pretty hilarious cast of characters, and it's I don't know if they if Mike Tyson just improvises a lot of the lines and then they animate around his improv, or if like it's scripted. But it doesn't seem like from some of the shit that he says, like it seems like it's Mike Tyson's brain just kind of yeah. Like so, it's I, I really really enjoy it. So that's that's been my favorite thing. I'm watching that with my romantic partner right What's now. What's that on? Um, I couldn't find it anywhere. I, I it used to be on Hulu. Um, I don't know if I should admit this on the air, but I had to pirate it because I couldn't find it. <laughs> it was originally on Adult Swim. Okay. If anyone knows where to get this, I'll gladly pay what it costs. <laughs> like, send, send me, send me something. I'll, I'll give you the money, but like, I have no idea where to get it. <laughs> so. That sounds fantastic. That sounds yeah, really funny. I highly recommend it. So that one's really good. Uh, what are you watching? Um, well, so I'd say like what you're saying like reminds me of Archer, which is one of my. There's a surgeon that I've actually had on the show where that's like his favorite show. It's really funny, like yeah. this ensemble cast, and yeah, it's it's really really good. Um, I've been watching Atlanta. Um, I've heard good things, but I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, Donald Glover is just such a fantastic entertainer. Um, that's cool. And, and not not what the hell else is he's he? I've seen him and stuff. So Community. Oh yeah. Duh. Um, yeah, Troy, and then he's. Uh, yeah. Also, Childish Gambino. Oh, cool. Um, so, yeah. Um, but he... Yeah, just a... He just was a, right community. Um, and, and, like, his character, like... And you could tell, like, he was in on the writing. Like, his character and, and like, playing with Abed. You know, he was, like, <laughs> billed as the dumb one. But, like, he... he his comedy was so... Well, I feel like Charlotte Kelly is like that in Always Sunny. Where... I don't... I've never actually seen oh, that. Oh, it's great. But there, yeah. it's 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 really intelligent humor disguised as like the stupidest humor. Right. So, Trailer Park Boys, I think, is similar. If you've ever seen that, I haven't. So, I I, yeah. um, I really love it. But it, you have to watch like a buddy of mine who's now like a product manager at Google, uh, is like um, the one that got me into it, and he um, he was like, you have to watch three episodes, and like you're gonna think it's ridiculous and stupid. Yeah. But like, if you don't like it by the end of the third episode, then turn it off. But like. I don't know if you if you get through that it's it's really self-referential but it's super funny and um it, it's just like a lot of the humors and the misconceptions of the characters 
And so the fact that their worldview is, is sort of like missing some bits, and so the conclusions they draw based on that lack of understanding is, is pretty hilarious. So, yeah. Yeah. That is, that's some deep thinking. I love it. Yeah, for sure. No, it takes, yeah. it's definitely an intelligent disco dis show disguised as an incredibly stupid one. Yeah. Atlanta, in some ways, is disguised as a, I mean, it's, it's somewhere in between drama and comedy. A dramedy. Um, it's a dramedy. Yeah. I and like, those. like just what, yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, I think it's a really, really high art. Um, it's one of my, I think it's one of the best shows on TV. Um, have you seen Barry yet? Speaking of dramedy, I have seen Barry. I, I like Barry. Yeah, I like Barry. A lot Barry's too. Barry's a little more mindless though. Yeah. Um, but oh, interesting. I would you use your favorite character in Barry if I could. No Ho Hank. Yeah, for me too. Like, I was gonna say, hands like, down. It's like, no Ho Hank. Like yeah, I mean he's he's good. He makes the show. Yeah. Um, his outfits that, like with that sun hat he's wearing in the one yeah and how how he just makes everything normal <laughs> everything is normal everything is easy low key right even though it's like super stressful yeah he's like Barry I know you said you were looking for work yeah. right, right. <laughs> trying to hire him to do a hit but like asking in the most yeah 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 like you said like normal kind of way yeah yeah, very, very... Remember that you were feeling aimless, like you had nothing to do? I can give you a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Barry's good. What else What else have I watched recently? I gotta check out Atlanta, it sounds like. Yeah, it's great. Um, I also watched Hentified recently. Um, Hentified is uh, produced by America Ferreira, um, who is, was on Dare to Lead the Brene Brown podcast oh, cool. um, and she was also the voice of um, the female character I forget her name one of the female characters in the How to Train Your Dragon animated show I didn't see that one yet and and like you, I mean you, like they're good um, but like if you don't have kids you know, yeah it's like, a good it's point I'm just not problem. exposed to that world it was actually America Ferreira and Hentified which she was in How to Train Your Dragon but Hentified I don't need anymore um, Hentified was um, yeah I mean it's another fantastic show about people who don't look like me um, which is like Atlanta um, and like The Wire, which is like one, still one of my all time favorite shows, which I will only probably ever watch once. Um, I tried watching it again and I own it um, on DVD. Um, <laughs> but like, I'm do you have a DVD player still? No. <laughs> of course not. No, I, like I do, but it's like not plugged in. Right? <laughs> nice. I like plug it in once in a while for like one of those movies that, yeah, is like still five bucks on Apple. My I parents own. gave me The Aristocrats DVD recently. Yeah. And I really wanted to be able to play it, uh, and the only DVD player I have is built into the head unit in my car. Yeah. And because of the way that I wired it in, I can't use it. <laughs> yeah. So, like, right, I guess I'm never going to watch this. You can probably stream it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not... It's probably on Prime. I'm not, like, clamoring to watch The it's Aristocrats again. It's clearly a Prime movie. I've watched that, I mean, probably, like, yeah, like, three or four times. I feel like that's enough. I've never actually seen it. Like, I should probably watch it. It's pretty funny. Yeah, I, I I think if you wanted to skip most of the movie, like Gilbert Gottfried's and Bob Saget's takes on the joke are the funniest in my opinion. Which is weird because Bob Saget, like just my childhood memories of Bob well, Saget are like hating the guy, <laughs> but like apparently his comedy was actually pretty reasonable. Yeah, no, I'm a big fan. Okay. There was that song that came out Rolling with Sag, which was like on YouTube. Yeah. And it was like these two white rappers and Bob Saget, like riding around in like an escalade like just just like just singing about being at a party like it was pretty funny and yeah bob saget like just deadpans all of his lines like eh, it's kind of hilarious and then yeah. um him and the aristocrat it's like the filthiest take on it like i think he he like goes yeah. way further than a lot of the other comics so that was pretty good yeah george carlin's was actually kind of disappointing which i i've always been a huge fan of his so it's yeah sort of sort of brutal to see him fall short but yeah, yeah. Um, Hentified though, like yeah, fabulous discussion of like just different different ways of being human. Um, yeah, just absolutely, and and told from the perspective of 
um, yeah, people who don't look like us, um, and also sort of the impact of of bringing money into those communities and money into a community um, that is different than you in the wrong way. Um, oh, interesting. Just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, basically money comes in and basically puts this taco shop that's been there for, you know, 30 years out of business. Um, and the meaning of the taco shop to different people, um, you know, in the family that owns it and then in the community. And tacos are fucking great. Yeah, they so are. So, like... Have you, you been know, to Las Palmas? I have not. That's my favorite taco place in Pittsburgh. If they're still around, I haven't checked after the pandemic. Where are they? Uh, Oakland. Okay. Um, so, it's... We used to go there when I was at the University of Pittsburgh as an yeah. undergrad, and um, it's like a little uh, supermarket, but they've got a taco stand in front, and they're mostly speaking Spanish, and it's you can get like a like a lomo like ribeye taco for mm. like um, it used to be like two or three bucks for a taco, and then you know corn tortilla, cilantro, lime, and onion. Yeah, uh, and it's like I don't know, like one of the ones that I go to in California when I was living there. It's fun. Yeah, actually, it's interesting. Like just thinking about that, I wonder how many, I wonder how many taco places in Pittsburgh are actually run by white people. Certainly, taco T A K O, <laughs> the butcher in the right. <laughs> That's actually really delicious. I love it. It's it was my favorite restaurant in town for a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what I'll do is like if I'm really into a place, I'll regular it for like a little too long, and then I'll sort yeah. of not enjoy it as much after that. Yeah. Speaking Same of which, I, I, I went to Butter Joint for the third time in a week nice. tonight. Because <laughs> um, they brought back the old burger as the old new burger. The old new burger is what they're calling it? Well, they were last week. Now they're just calling it the burger. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you know the story behind this? No. Okay. I've been to Butter Joint. Hands but down, this. best burger in Pittsburgh. Best burger. Like, it's, it's really fucking good. Nice. Um, and... It's, uh, they, what they use, they take temperatures, so they're, like, checking, constantly checking it, instead of just, like, having it on, having it just, like, this grill assembly line. That's not common practice. I, I don't know. Like, you know, they also ground the meat. All I know is it just tastes fantastic. Yeah. Um, and they just talk about the temps, so I don't know what they're talking about. I'm just, I'm just saying it like it's... A lot it's, of times I feel like it's turn and burn. So you just, yeah. you're estimating and trying to reach an internal temperature by time. And they were doing a smash burger for a couple of years, like basically through the pandemic, um, after they shut down. Um, and then they finally brought this back. Um, and nice. so for me, it's been like, you know, three years waiting for this to come back. <laughs> and I think I'm, I'm going a little too far in like, yeah, in, uh, in, in eating too many, but you know, <laughs> it's something where I was just like, yeah, I'm going to do it. No, yeah, I mean, it's delicious. It's delicious. Yeah. Yeah. I went on this, uh, I call it my, my stupid keto diet that I, yeah. I've been doing off and on, but I lost like a bunch of weight, like probably 25 pounds. And then I just was like, ah, I'm good. And I just neglected the diet. I gained it all back. <laughs> so, I'm at that point now where I'm like, I probably should should start dieting again and, and lose the weight again. I think you got to find something that just fits, right? Yeah. Like find something that that works for you. Um, well, I mean, I like burgers, but I like like having muscle definition more than I like burgers. But you know, I mean, it doesn't mean I can't ever eat a burger. Like, right. I think it just means I have to have moderation. But if I'm trying to like go down from a high, then I probably need to be a little more aggressive. But that controls algorithm's not great. But so I don't know if you do, right? Like, um, you know, if you have a, a calorie deficit of, you know, 200 calories a day, right? It'll just take you, take you a lot longer. Well, that's the thing is keto is an elimination diet. So I'm not really monitoring calories, but, but I you probably need, could do that. Do you need to do keto? No. I've chosen to do it. There's no, re I don't have celiacs or anything like that. So what, I mean, what about like finding ways to just slowly make your diet more healthy, but also maintainable? Like, Interesting. What are the things that you really like to eat that you don't want to give up? Like sushi. Okay. Um, is it the, is it the rice or is it the fish? The fish, definitely more than the rice. Okay. So, so I mean that, that's like, you can easily jump to... Um, like sashimi, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, that, and I, I, that's what I've done, right? And so I guess the things I miss the most when I'm cutting out carbohydrates are like, I like a good slice of pizza from time to time is really nice. Yeah. Like, um, and then maybe, I'm trying to think what else. Honestly, it gets easier. Like, I feel like when you start, when you start with one of these things, it's like, like uh, pasta, this, this, that, and then you'll say, I don't really. Maybe crunch in a salad. So like like croutons it's on like a Caesar is something, something that would be nice to have. That I feel like that's doable. Yeah. yeah. Like just a, like because that's something you don't have to have a ton of, right? I usually, usually throw like pecans on instead, just to have like less carbs, which, which are still good. good. This yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. Especially toasted. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Very little better than a toasted pecan. I I agree. And, and then, then like, like one thing, thing I found that was really good lately is, is like pistachios because they, they add like another flavor element. Yeah. So that's that's a fun one too. Yeah, I'll do blueberries on a salad, like a little bit of granola. I guess I miss fruit also. Yeah, that's one I haven't really been able to do a whole lot of lately. Yeah, so that's that's one that's like actually not that high in calories if you pick the right fruits at the right in the right way interesting right. raspberries, raspberries are probably my favorite, favorite fruit but i haven't had them for like apparently like raspberries months. are every all the every time i read something by any sort of dietitian they're like just eat more raspberries interesting like tons of antioxidants like very i think it's low glycemic index um so yeah just like a really good fruit yeah yeah i love raspberries too yeah, they're super good yeah yeah do you, like, do you like do you like sour beers, beers as well if you're into that flavor profile of a raspberry? I used to. I mean, I, actually, actually, the beer that I started on was Lindemann's Frambois. Oh, I love that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> I mean, how can you not? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I've since graduated. I went through like that. Took me into Belgians, nice, which are very sweet. I love those. Super high alcohol, and then that triples and quads. quads. <laughs> Never really got into quads. They're a little yeah. too much for me. That's fair. I mean, had a few, but yeah. triples triples were a big thing for a while. I'd probably drink too much beer whenever I visit Belgium. Belgium. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just order, order triples and quads. quads. I've never done it, but yeah. Like <laughs> it's I, I it's one of my favorite places to visit. I think, I think Morocco and Belgium are my two favorite countries I've been to. Ooh, tell me about Morocco. So it's just, uh, I went to Marrakesh. So, I guess I'm telling the story. I, um, I was asked to officiate um, a friend's wedding in Portugal, and so I hadn't had time off in a while. I decided to go somewhere else in the world. So, it was between Amsterdam, Marrakesh, and I think Prague at the time, which I've all since visited, but at the time I hadn't been to any of them. And I asked one friend, and she was just like, go to Marrakesh. It's like the most interesting out of those three options, at least of a cliche. So, I went there, and I, um, I, the, the way, way that I'll go into a new country that I've never been to a lot of the time is I'll try to get like an Airbnb that's a shared space for at least my first couple of nights there, uh, like something kind of hostily, because I feel like that's how you're going to meet people and figure out what's around you. And then I might do like like a more kind of, you know, like luxurious or whatever you want to call it. I might, I might go with something like a little more like, you know, fancy, like later on once I've started to make some friends in the area. But, but like, like at, at first, first at least I want to I want to lay down some roots. I want to get to know people. And so, um, the first things I did was I got this Airbnb, and I remember asking one guy, I'm like, hey, so I see the Sahara Desert's like an hour drive away. Um, do you know anyone that can rent me a car to take out to Sahara? And he's like, do not do that. So I found another Airbnb. <laughs> it was like, maybe even just throwing out the fee because it wasn't that much money. Um, but I went to this other place, and the guys were like, absolutely, I know a guy that takes all cash. You know, I can make that happen. So I'm just like, great. So I um, I got a Range Rover Evoque for for all cash. The guy took my passport as collateral, and um, it was it was definitely the most expensive thing I got during that trip because I mean, it's like a ten to one buying power to the Durham to the dollar, and so like just a lot of really good food, a lot of really nice people. Um, the guy I bought my SIM card off of, I exchanged numbers with. And later on, ended up in a situation where I wasn't going to be able to get to Portugal in time for the wedding. And so I figured out a way to, I found a flight from Casablanca where he lived. And he like helped me figure out how to get from Marrakesh to Casablanca on trains. Then I stayed in a house that was like probably half the size of this, you know, not that big office. Um, with like, 
I want to say like seven other people uh, that night, and I, I felt so welcome. Like his parents were really nice people. Yeah. Um, I mean, the mom only spoke Arabic, which I, I don't speak except for the word for thank you. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, like you know, that was just really pleasant. It was the best food I had while I was there. It was just a home cooked tagine by by his mom, and and it's such nice like shirt off their back folks. You know, like. I mean, they had like a bottle of ginger ale, which was kind of fancy for them that they brought out and, you know, were trying to share with me. And I, I just, it was, it was really, really nice. Uh, we found this pigeon, like in the guy's chimney. <laughs> we were just like kind of staying up and hanging out and, you know, fucking around. And, and it's just, I don't know, like one of the points that drove home is like, you don't need crazy, expensive, fancy stuff to have a good time. Like, I mean, I've, I've had way less fun at the Fairmont than I had at that, you know, tiny ass apartment with you know a buttload of people sleeping on every surface you know yeah yeah absolutely like that sounds so fantastic and I think I do a lot of well I don't do a lot of thinking about fear now but uh, fear is one of those things that uh, I think in a lot of cases like will keep people from doing trips like that yeah um, and so you know fantastic that you had the you know either you didn't have the fear or you had courage to fall to to go ahead and it's probably the latter because i read trip advisor and people posted kind of tariff like one lady talked about like some anecdote about her husband getting held up at knife point and it's like right i don't know if you don't act like a tourist like you're probably going to be fine you know and even if somebody holds you up at night worst case they get money they need more than you you know and so i don't know yeah give them your money <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah have you been held up at gunpoint? Give them your money <laughs> if you're listening. It's way yes. cheaper than the legal fees, always, even if you shoot or stab them. Like, always give them your money. Yeah, it's a better option. Don't get hurt. Um, yeah. No, I think, uh, yeah. I'm Not gonna, on that trip, I might add. Morocco was really friendly. So. I'm this was be, in New York. <laughs> so. I'm excited. I'm going to be going to the, the, to the Galapagos. Badass. Um, yeah, in, in July. Um, and I found, you know, basically th through a friend found an eco travel agent. Um, somebody who's trying to build a business doing eco travel. Um, What's eco travel? Basically travel that you're trying to minimize your impact on the environment, oh, cool. minimize your impact on everything. And so like one of the things that actually convinced me to do this, right, is like Galava goes, you probably shouldn't go. <laughs> and then it's like, well, actually like gonna go like I want to go scuba diving I want to see a whale shark oh there are these scientists that run this whale shark project oh neat um, and basically they're tagging whale sharks um, I think I've heard they pay for it by taking on people that are lodging right so so yeah. yeah and I don't know if there's more than one but that's exactly what I'm doing so that's awesome gonna go live on so a you're boat. funny their research live on a, yeah live on a boat pay them you know more than I would normally pay for for a vacation but it's also something where it's like oh you know I, I can get behind this right I, yeah. it's something where like this is meaningful this is um, yeah this seems seems somewhat important seems important right um, yeah. yeah conservation like these are yeah absolutely amazing animals um, yeah just yeah yeah, it's awesome. Figuring out like carbon offsets and things like that, and don't know how well those actually. Yeah, work. that always struck me as a little bit of a hustle, if I'm being upfront. Yeah. Like buying yeah. carbon credits to like, it almost kind of strikes me as like, and I'll not rant for too long on this, but it almost strikes me as similar to like paying a bunch of money to the Catholic Church during the Crusades to go murder people. It's like, not that it's not that it's equivalent, but you know what I mean. Like if you don't really know. Well, I mean, I think that that raises a good point. Um, well, well, it raises a point. You know, it's it's not. You know, I. I you know, it's, yeah, it's like, can you actually sort of back off or, or like trade money, you know, to actually really impact your carbon footprint? Yeah. Right. Um, if you're buying it from someone and it's a zero sum game, that's that's one thing and that doesn't work. Yeah. If someone is using that to plant trees, um, okay. and those trees have, you know, a measurable impact, um, or you're you're doing something that is going to, you know, basically allow someone to do something that 
would, you know, they would normally like burn down a chunk of forest, right? And yeah. now they can just leave it there. You know, that, that would be another thing. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. But I guess, how do you audit that process? Like, how do you know? This is me being a distrusting, I think cynical that's, bastard. But well, so I think that's a really good, I, I think, you know, that's, that's actually a really good perspective to take. Um, and, and I think that that's one of those things where, you know, it's not always, well, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily going to work right now. Um, yeah, like, I guess right now it feels like the best thing I can do. Um, and, and maybe I shouldn't be taking the trip, right? No, I mean, um, it sounds like a cool trip. And if you're funding people's research. Yeah. But, but, uh, but it's also like, you know, how do we, I mean, this is, this goes back to the education side, right? Where it's like thinking about if we can train people to think, train people with, you know, the ability to understand how to think in terms of like abstraction process, like modeling and process, right? Composition, decomposition, sequencing, lack of sequencing, all those things, right? Then we're actually training people who are going to be able to build the technologies. I, I, I think there's a really good chance we're not going to be able to stop climate change without without a bunch of new technologies. Yeah. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm almost certain of it, right? Um, just, I, I think there are all sorts of things we need to do. You know, social change is one of them. Eating less meat, right? I just talked about eating a burger. <laughs> um, Delicious. That being said, you know, have also been bringing in Beyond Burgers, right? Yeah. And probably like three out of four burgers that I eat are vegetarian burgers. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and I that, found these. I found these one gram of net carb buns today at Aldi, and I was so so happy with that. And then you're going for what are you gonna? Now I can eat a burger. I, I mean, I, I put a piece of salmon on one today, which was quite good. Yeah. So that yeah. was that was my lunch, but nice, delicious. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's yeah, it's like how do we? So I mean, I think it's good to be skeptical there, and like honestly, maybe that'll will get me to go back and and actually like think through a little bit more about about what this trip is. Yeah. Well, part of it is too I want to write about the trip and yeah. like be writing about the economics right like what is it like how much of that money is actually going to the researchers yeah right be figuring that out how much of the money is going to the people in Quito Ecuador who are who are basically helping me plan right yeah. how many are going to you know other people in this chain I've heard good things about Quito yeah yeah I don't I mean I, I've got I'll have a date there um, with a guide and hopefully it'll it'll get me to go back. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. One of my friends has been trying to talk me into El Salvador, which he's from there, so he's biased. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you go with him, like that'd be fun. Like I, I think I'd want. Uh, yeah, I mean, going with a local feels like a a smart move. Um, he just started working for Google, though. <laughs> I feel like he's yeah. got no time. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, for sure. I think it would be way fun to go with that dude. Yeah. And, um, yeah, no, I completely agree. But, I mean, the Airbnb trick work. Like, have you done that before? Like, just staying, like, on someone's couch just to, to network, basically? I haven't, but that sounds like a good idea. Yeah. It's, it's like, my, it's my go-to move. And then a lot of times what I'll do is I'll bring, like, a bottle of whiskey or just something. Like, I'll even, like, I might just buy it there. And then I'll just give it as a gift immediately to the people I'm with, and then you open that up with them, and he's making friends. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I think that, that idea of uh, making friends in a place that you go is a really good one. That's my favorite way to travel. Like, that's... I don't understand... And I, hopefully I don't alienate anyone here, but I understand going on cruises or, like, why you'd want to go to, like, a resort in a country that, you know, like... Like, I don't... I mean, maybe if you just wanted, like, some isolation and, like, R&R, &R, like, maybe that's the reason. But, like, I don't know. Like, surely you could do that, you know, like, closer to... I don't know. Yeah. Like, when I... I, I went to France pretty recently. I, I think I told you about this. I, I took, um, like, two weeks in Paris. I wish I had spent that time in the Riviera or in Belgium. <laughs> but um, I took two weeks in Paris. Then I went down to the Riviera... Riviera was awesome. I got a place in a hostel um, environment through Airbnb that I found in Nice. And, um, sorry, no, that was in Antibes. I stayed in Nice before that in, like, a guy's apartment. 
um, where I made friends with this dude from Spain who was, he was a software engineer and he was just road tripping around Europe. Like he just he had come from Italy like that day and it was, it was just on vacation. Um, so he was kind of fun to hang out with him and I had a meal together. Um, but in Nice, it was really fun because there was this lady, Carol, that was my Airbnb host. And um, I bought like two bottles of whiskey. I got like one from Scotland and one from Japan. And I'm like, you want Scottish or Japanese, you know? I went Japanese, so we opened the Japanese one, and it was like a it was like a flop house for boat crews. So in the south of France, uh, have you been there? Like, so there, it, it's it's like a parking ground for yachts. So like in Nice and in Antibes in particular, like there were just a buttload of giant mega yachts like parked there, and it, it was kind of interesting. And then one thing that really stuck out to me was in Nice, I, I was walking around on these like concrete like barrier that I think it was there to keep boats from like crashing or create a harbor. I'm not exactly sure, but they were these long, con large concrete things and there were homeless people that had set up tents under the concrete. And then probably less than a hundred meters away, there was the biggest yacht I've ever seen in my life. And so it was really weird to see that like in the yeah. same, you know, being able to turn your head. But, um, anyway, going forward to Antibes, um, well, I brought out the whiskey, uh, like a back door open, and there were just all these French people like hanging out and barbecuing, and um, none of the other guests were there. They just invited me into like their their private thing, and uh, there was one guy that made like psychedelic art that I ended up really bonding with, um, and him and I had this great conversation, and he was showing me a bunch of his art on the walls, and uh, they had like a skirt steak going that was super delicious, and it was just really really fun. And then I stayed in touch with Carol, and she was, like, sending me pictures of, like, a roast pig with the apple in it yeah. in its mouth and all this stuff. And I was, like, sending her pictures of the stuff I was doing in the Alps. And, you know, it was, it was pretty fun. I guess the, the most social trips I've been on recently have been scuba trips, because you meet a lot of people in the boat. That's awesome. Um, and, I've, yeah, there are a few people I've, I've kept up with a little bit, like, through educational connections. Nice. Um, but I think, yeah, the... You know, in terms of doing what you're talking about, right? Like, yeah. Um, I think maybe, you know, in Iceland, like I, I went to Iceland. I've been wanting to go there for a while. Yeah, like like maybe three years ago, a year before pandemic, I ended up going. Um, and, you know, it was like the $500 flights. And it was just... Oh, when they were doing those wild flights? Yeah. For like barely any money yeah it was great and maybe it's three hundred dollars um but like yeah to fly across the world i mean that's awesome yeah i mean it's <laughs> yeah it's like eight hours eight ish yeah. hours um so it's not that far but uh but yeah i mean it's it was great and then you know there stayed with tried tried to do that in terms of staying at places that had a bunch of rooms and may, maybe like a b and b right yeah. like where you have you know places where you can kind of hang out, um, like, like common space, um, not quite a hostel. Um, definitely, definitely met a lot of good people hiking awesome. in New Zealand. Um, that was fantastic. That's really um, cool. Yeah. But I mean, those are also both like very Western, you know, European kind of American. I mean, so is France. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I think, yeah, that's one of those things where, but Morocco is not, right? Morocco would feel, yeah. that feels a bit out of the comfort zone. Yeah. Um, you know, in Roatan, Honduras, right? Stayed at a resort. Oh, cool. Um, and that's one of those where I think staying off resort probably would have been outside the comfort zone. But that being said, like, what you're talking about, right? Figuring out ways to get outside your comfort zone. And it's like, powerful. I mean, and it helps with anxiety too. Like if you can yeah. overcome that fear and I do have a lot of fear that I carry, <laughs> you know, I mean, it just makes, I feel like it makes you stronger. Like, I don't know. Yeah. And, and being able to like, I mean, honestly, like showing people that I, I do think it's important. Like there are a lot of people in this country and like who, who seem to think that people from other places are bad. Yeah. Right. Or, or like none of that here. Um, and that's one of those things where it's like, I mean, I, yeah, I, I'm definitely against that. Like I just meet so many people and like one-on-one -on -one 
most of the people you meet oh, are just fantastic. Cool. Yeah, like awesome. Yeah. It's it's only it seems to be like when we get in groups we start making <laughs> I've had some bad experiences like traveling too. I mean like Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, well, I guess, yeah, yeah, but, and so that's... I'm like usually that, able to jujitsu it into something good, but... Yeah? I mean, you know, if you have money and the ability to leave a place and go to another one... There's that. to help. Right? Like, that's, that is really helpful. And I think, you know, yeah, I think being able to... It's really nice to go to a city that's safe. Yeah. Um, but again, like, most of the trouble I've ever had, like, with just maybe what I'll call like, you know, people trying to intimidate me on the street or like, you know, having a gun in my face has been in New York. I've never had a gun in my face. That yeah. is terrifying. Yeah, that's that's happened in the United States and you know, what's regarded as like you know, the greatest city. And I'm going there like this weekend. Like I'm not against New York. Yeah. I have family and friends there. Where was it? Uh, Central Park in Manhattan. Central Park, like during the day? No, it was late. Me and a buddy were going to eat some cannoli like around like 11 p.m. And okay. these two guys walked behind us, then cocked the slide on a Glock and... Uh, you gave him your money. I froze up. I, I was too proud to just say, take my money, but too scared to say, fuck you. And so I just was standing there like this. <laughs> It's a perfectly fine reaction. Yeah, and then the other guy that didn't have the gun patted me down expertly, I might add. He'd done this before and <laughs> took all the shit in my pockets. I, look, what makes it an expert? I should have given them my money. What, what is an expert pat down? I, I've been patted down by like bouncers going into you know events, and those guys are like, this guy like you know he like had his fingers like they were like, like he was feeling for like he was just really good at it like he didn't miss anything in my pockets and yeah. like it was almost like a gentler touch like he just had more tactile control like it was i mean it's hard to describe but no i, mean, I think almost, that makes like sense. a practice masseuse or something that makes like, sense. knew what he was doing yeah yeah no good that they got the money well what was annoying is i if i had just given them my cash like i probably could have kept my ids and not had to like get an emergency key cut from the one I'd had in my briefcase. That can be really interesting, right? Like unlock my car for $300 in the airport parking lot. Yeah, negotiating for that. Guys, you're not going to be, you're probably not going to be able to Well, my buddy cards. from Brooklyn that I was walking with knew to do that. And so, yeah. like, I mean, they even gave his phone back because it was too shitty to sell. Yeah. Like, you know, whereas I got all my shit stolen. So, I mean, I feel like... Well, there was another time I was on the 6 train going from Brooklyn to Manhattan, or I guess it was lower Manhattan because I had to transfer to the 6, but yeah. I remember um, there was this guy, I, I, so I was, I was looking at the thing because it was late and I was like a little bit disoriented, and I was looking at the thing with all the lights that says what stop you're at and where you're going and just trying to figure out, like, you know, I'm staying with my parents, they live on, you know, XYZ Street, you know, and yeah. I, I'm trying to get to that one, and so... Um, I sort of glanced and I got back down and one guy goes, hey man, you lost? I'm like, no, I'm good. And he's like, you know, because you sort of have to just muster up the courage in that situation. He's sizing me up. And so he's like, well, if you're not lost, then why are you looking at the thing? And I go, I thought the whole fucking point of the thing was not to get lost. And he goes, you're not from around here, are you? And I went, yeah, no, I'm not. And he goes, well, where are you from? I said, I'm from Pittsburgh. Where are you from? <laughs> and he goes, born and raised, baby. And I said, I know that asshole. What part of the city are you from? <laughs> he goes, Brooklyn. I'm like, I just come from Brooklyn. I love it there. You know, I'm creating common ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just to, to try to get to know the guy and endear him to me so he doesn't beat the shit out of me and take all my stuff. <laughs> and so, <laughs> basically, um, he's like, I'm like, and then there's another guy next to him with a neck tattoo. And I'm like, so where are you from? You know, <laughs> they're clearly together. And um, he's like, oh, I'm from Queens. You know, in Queens, we got rats that are the size, you know, like this big. And I'm like, Oh, that's the size of cats. I get it. So let me tell you a story. I was dating this girl one time, and she had to bash her brat's brains in with, brains in with a fire extinguisher, uh, you know, that day. And, and I came home after that, you know, and he was like, that was there really blood gross. and guts and shit everywhere? And I was like, I don't know. I wasn't there. You know, but I would imagine. <laughs> and he just fucking smashed it in the face. So <laughs> the guys are like, you know, like, seem amused by all this. And I, I'm not even indicating, but I'm, like, looking over one of their shoulders to see, like, from the wall, not from the thing anymore, 
what stop I'm at. And I'm like, all right, guys, this is my stop. I'll see you later. <laughs> fist bump, fist bump. Out the door, unmolested. <laughs> yeah, Base. nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, nice. Talk your way out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so. so is there anything else you want to talk about? Because I need to... Oh, yeah, no worries. Um, usually at the end, I just ask if there's anything someone wants to plug. So I feel like 412 Food Rescue. <laughs> oh, yeah, you should definitely... Uh, I mean, donate and, and like, go and try to give time, right? Volunteer a tiny bit. Um, volunteering, oh, my God. Well, not everyone can volunteer in schools. Um, you know, it takes, you got to get clearances and, you know. It's not that hard. I mean. It's not, but it, 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 like, it's a commitment that's more than just, like, a couple hours. That's true. Um, so something where, yeah, I don't know, just, um, yeah. 412 Food Rescue is fantastic, but so is, you know, WYUP, so is, um, you know, Assemble, so is Community Forge, um, all sorts of places that are just like fantastic places, fantastic people doing things that they just believe in in the city. Um, and yeah, I don't have anything of my own right now, but like, yeah, at some point, like hope to, um, and hope to figure out, like really figure out like this capitalism thing, like there's some parts of it that really work, right? Some of the th parts that really work is like this ability for, like to even have these 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 groups that are trying to do CS education. Yeah. And, and there, you know, I do think there's something to, also to understanding, you know, what Duolingo seemed to have figured out. Um, oh, Duolingo's great fantastic company yeah. like they do you know they've kept language learning free for 10 years um and you know there's somewhere in there i don't know how effective they are um like i think they're becoming more and more effective but like i don't th still don't think you're at that they're at that goal where they can actually you can get on duolingo and then you can go get a job with those skills yeah um but you know some of that's you know because yeah, they started with the, the technology side and you gotta eventually have conversations with with people. Yeah, well, um, immersion, I think you need to, yeah. but it helps to Duolingo before you go to a new country just to sort of get into right. your... Right, and so like how do you, but but like even Duolingo like will be hamstrung by being a, a um, and probably was hamstrung a little bit at times by being, and, and very lucky to be first in terms of how, how they did what they were, what they did um, you know, probably had to make some decisions because of VC, probably have to make some decisions now because of being public. And so it's, it's something where how do you, how do you bring together some of that sensibility of, you know, that you get out of capitalism of being, um, well, yeah, being a little bit scrappy, but then also in education, right? Making sure you stay focused on, on what really matters. It's, helping kids, um, helping teachers help kids, um, you know, without, without really cranking that wheel of like, you know, parental anxiety. Cause we can sell shit to parents. Like that's easy. Oh dude. I, when I started my tutoring business, I remember like, yeah, I thought I was going to be teaching kids new stuff and like working with young minds. And I was really excited about all that. And then I found it was just parents who wanted their kids to do well on the SATs, and it was so demoralizing. I mean, when yeah. I volunteered with high school kids uh, on a robotics team that I mentored for a while, very similar, like the parents, just the drama that came with having to interface with parents, that love their kids and don't want them to get hurt, and all, but they're so anxious and fucking annoying and difficult to deal with when you're just trying to help and educate and pass on a lesson. This is such a... Yeah, no, I mean, no disrespect. <laughs> no, 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 like, like, I think, like, that actually, I mean, that, that would go down a totally different path in terms of discussing, I mean, discussing parental anxiety, and it, it's really, yeah, we didn't even get into really, you know, deep discussion of emotion. We can do this again if how, you want to. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah how, how, have to. I'm just I offering mean, No, 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 right, stuff, right. Yeah. It's just, yeah, tonight I'm, I'm exhausted. Yeah. But, like, I figured you, know, you wanted to see your family and stuff. So. Like, Brene Brown talks, yeah. like, like, her, like, one of the things that she talks about is emotion and sort of how, um, how it fits into modern life. And she talks a lot to, you know, she, she deals a lot with professionals. And so, you know, it's one of these things where, like, you know, 
parents these days, right? If you went to Carnegie Mellon, you think about, I want my son or daughter to go to Carnegie Mellon or to go to Stanford, or to go to MIT or an Ivy League, right? Yeah. Um, because there's open doors. But like those schools are significantly harder to get into sure. than they ever were before. And they cost way more than they ever did before. Yeah, I mean, the competition is global. Yeah, and so, so it just, you know, like, selling to parental anxiety especially like people with money is definitely possible um it's like how do we how do we like get this nice sort of virtuous cycle going where you get the money from those people right from the people who 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 are making half a million dollars a year at google or half a million dollars you know doing you know medicine at upmc right how do you get them feeding the system? How do you get feeding education? How do you get Google, which isn't paying any taxes, right? How do you get them- Google doesn't pay taxes? I don't think so. How, How the fuck, fuck do they, they get around that? Well, like there are all sorts of laws, right? They just put, put pieces of their company in different places. Oh, I see. It's more of an offshore shell game than UPMC is being a not-for-profit. I, I mean, yeah. like this is a huge issue, um, like with big tech. Mm -hmm. uh, big tech does not pay a lot of taxes. Yeah. Um, and, and big companies don't pay a lot of taxes. Um, there's something where back in the 50s, they paid a lot of taxes. Um, and apparently actually were proud of paying taxes. Yeah. Um, and then we have a, a, you know, a, a, um, a bridge that's like a mile from my house that fell over. Right. How many times a day does an Amazon truck go, did an Amazon truck go across that bridge? And how much did Amazon actually pay? towards that bridge's upkeep. I'm guessing probably fractional. I'm guessing I probably pay more, Jeez. pay more. Um, that's a guess. Yeah. But like, it's a fairly educated in terms of like, how good these, these companies are doing that. And that's, that's with full understanding that by me owning the mutual funds I do, right? I'm very clearly invested in those companies. Yeah. Um, but you know, if I had a vote, right? If I could, if I could vote and, and change what they're doing, I'd say pay some taxes, right? Like I'll take a little hit on the on the the earnings. Yeah. Um, I'll take a yeah. I'll take a little hit on the earnings. Um, that's okay. Yeah. I honestly, I think companies that uh, like like what I would really like to see. I'll plug this. This will be the last thing I plug. I would sure. love to see in the next twenty years, and and would love to be part of this. Um, corporations that take a legitimate stance that money isn't the only thing, that we have stakeholders and those stakeholders, we're, we're trying to solve problems for people um, and money is not the only measurement of human value. In fact, it is a proxy for emotion. It is a proxy for joy. It is a proxy for you know, all the positive emotions you might have, right? From, you know, the positive emotion you get out of like you know, knowing you can eat, you know, yeah. you, we're getting that. You don't have to worry about the bills or if the power is going to go off. Yeah. Um, so eating something, something really delicious that maybe isn't the easiest to find. Yeah. Um, so like, like, I, like saying, like, like I want to see companies that actually have that mission. I want to see them being these people who are, have these new PE ratios, right? Of like the price to earnings ratio. Yeah. Um, whereas right now, the companies that are, you know, giving our kids anxiety, you know, making them want to click all the time. Oh, right? yes. Like, like those are the... I got off everything except LinkedIn. Yeah, those are the, those are the companies that have the ridiculous PE ratios and the ridiculous, um, the ridiculous market caps um, that don't really make sense in terms of the way we used to value business um, and don't make sense now, right? And it all comes down to how people feel about it. And I think, you know, that's gonna start coming, like, right, you know, it's correcting itself right now, maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that correction is hitting my bottom line, but it's also something where it's like, yeah, it should. Yeah. Like, it's wrong. Um, it's, yeah, it's ridiculous. But yeah. I wanna see, I wanna see companies that actually take care of the world that like think about true cost, right? Where do you think the incentive would come from for a company to do that? Like, I think it's just it, public opinion. Absolutely, right? Yeah. If people are going to say, if, if people would start saying, I'm going to buy this company because they actually are stewards of the world and I'm not going to buy this company, that's all it takes. Yeah. 
it's because because price like clearly the PE ratio right which which should be like should have something to do with what evaluation is right clearly it is so out of whack right like there's something else well that something else is how people feel about the stock yeah do they feel like it's going to grow and like honestly these companies that are growing out of control like and not growing out of control right you're, but if you're a company at two trillion dollars right do you need to grow anymore right like didn't we have this thing in 2008 where companies were too big to fail <laughs> we bailed those companies out they were in the 200 billion range right now we're talking about trillion dollar companies and, and they continue to grow um i don't know like that's that's one of those things where yeah now i'm just rambling no it's all good this is interesting but like i really hope that i hope that companies that uh that, that are stewards of the world get a premium price and i hope that companies that aren't stewards of the world start to see oh we're actually going to take a real hit because we're not actually thinking about the future yeah i hope you're right i don't know i think probably both ideas will coexist in some way because there's always going to be a market for exploitation and <laughs> things that aren't great I, I i don't know maybe i'm wrong but I also think that, you know, if you actually do the right thing, that appeals to a lot of people. So. I think it's, it's helping people understand that, like, they get to make the choice, right? So you, you vote with choose. your money is basically... Yeah. 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 And hopefully, yeah, hopefully, like, a lot more, yeah. I don't know, we could get into ESG and, and all that other stuff, but, like, honestly, that's... In, like, that seems like a sham, too. Um, ESG? Um, environmental social governance but there are like 600 ways to measure it yeah so like, I feel like that could all be manipulated like yeah 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 cool. I mean it's yeah so it's I'm fantastic. happy to keep talking I don't want to I, I know <laughs> I'm, I realize like I'm exhausted and need to like get up and, and do some work tomorrow do some no, it's all good I'm, but I yeah. really enjoy talking yeah this has been really fun thanks for coming on yeah thank you Thank you.